lending doc AI, procurement doc AI, and auto ML natural language and translation product line, which was featured by Wired as top 10 innovations of 2018. She currently leads the language and doc AI teams on Google Cloud. And that was. And lastly, we also have our wonderful core staff here, are the last three judges that we have. Uh, Kimberly and Megan, I'm sure you guys have already met them before, hopefully uh, in the previous half of the quarter. So now let's go over really quickly the format of the demo. Every group has seven minutes in total, and you have to leave at least two minutes for Q&A. So we will give you a heads up. So Megan will give you a heads up at the three minute mark, and we will have to cut you off at the five minute mark. So you will have at least two minutes for Q&A. Please make sure you know when you're presenting and who the group is before you. You should be prepared to come up to the stage and set up your laptop while the previous group is answering questions. A few technical details. Please make sure that you have your slides up and ready to go before you plug in your computer on the stage here. If the screen is not showing after you plug it in, do not freak out. Try to jiggle the cord a little bit and wait a few seconds. <laughs> Lastly, there will be Judges' Choice Awards and Students' Choice Awards, and these will be announced at the end after all the demos are done. There's also food and drinks outside. Unfortunately, food and drinks are not allowed in the auditorium, but during the break time, and if you wanna, if you feel hungry, thirsty, please go out and grab some food and drinks. That's it. Uh, now we have our first group, AI NFT Generation. Um, thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Rosie. I'm an EE master's student. I'm Andre. I'm a CS co term. And our project is on AI NFT generation. So, just as an info, um, NFTs are non fungible tokens or digital unique tokens on the blockchain that can't be replaced by anything else. NFTs have radically redefined the art world. Um, the most expensive piece of art sold in 2021 was $69 million, sold by an artist who was previously selling his work for a mere $100. Um, so, the motivation from this project is seeing friends and siblings of ours that are artists um, have a gap between connecting their talent to an ability to market their work as NFTs. Um, and a large contributor to this is the limited size of an artist's collection, in contrast with NFT collections like CryptoPunks, which are 10,000 images. So when an artist has to upload each image individually and create each, each image individually, this limits the scale and the potential of their art. So our application allows artists to upload images of their choosing from their own collection and expand that collection either by generating new images with similar content and style with their existing work or by customizing existing NFTs like CryptoPunks and Bored Apes in their personal style. Okay, awesome. So here you can see kind of the MVP our first version just takes in some initial images and, gener and what it does is just does some combination basically just adding the images um, and doing some thresholding as well. You can see sometimes it works well, kind of like for crypto punks, but um, images like the, for images like this, it's it's okay, um, but not as doesn't perform as well. Um, so then, our final version, um, the way the architecture was set up, so we had a front end React was hosted on Google API or sorry Google App Engine, uh, back end Flask back end on Cloud Run, and then we use Google Cloud Storage to kind of store all the images and kind of retrieve them back and forth. Um, and yeah, so now we can kind of move to an actual live demo version of this. Awesome. So now we're going to do some, some NFT generation live for you guys, which will be really exciting. Um, so this is our, our website that's actually live up and running. So after this, if you guys want to try generating your own NFTs, the, the URL is cs329s-nftgenerator.com. Um, so we're going to go through the two flows. The first flow is applying the style of your art onto existing NFT collections. So let's just say we want to apply our, our art style to CryptoPunks. We actually had one of our artists send us a couple of their images. So we're going to go here and let's select these last two. And so you can see this is the artist collection. This is the, uh, the style that we want to transfer over to the CryptoPunks. And so we're going to start generating the images. And so what's happening right now is that these images are actually being sent over to our backend, to our cloud function server. And we're actually um, applying the, the style onto, of these images onto a small sample of CryptoPunks. And so now, as you can see, we've developed in just a matter of seconds, 10 new images that this artist would be able to upload to OpenSea, for example, and, and, then, um, and then market the, their, their art as NFTs. So this is the first flow. The second flow is, let's assume that an artist has a collection of small images. 
So let's look for some images here. If we go back to folder, we'll use the silhouettes. And again, five images is good, but existing NFT collections usually are in the thousands or ten thousands of images. So we can actually select how many images we want to generate. Let's say we want to generate 10 new images. And essentially, we'll be combining these images using contents and styles of each other to create novel images that we would be able to expand this collection for. So similarly, we're going to start generating the images here, and we'll see them as they're, they come in and are generated. And so now, as we can see, and again, in just a matter of seconds, we have five new images in the same style and content that this artist would be able to upload and, and sell as NFTs. Um, and the other option we give them is to actually just download, you can click it, download it here, and now these artists have these locally as well. So they're able to see the art. Um, right now, we have the, the, these two options for the existing collections. We have your CryptoPunks and Board Apes, um, but you can see sort of how this goes. So if you guys want to try this on your own art, again, feel free. This, this website is live. Um, and yeah, that's, that's our demo. So thank you so much for listening and really appreciate your, your feedback. So what is your favorite NFT that you generated? Favorite <laughs> NFT that we've generated? Um, we really like this collection, the, the one we showed with the silhouettes. That was actually a, a good friend of ours. She, she was the motivation for this project because I was trying to help her market her art as NFTs. Um, and so the silhouettes were like her first collection and we were trying to expand it. We couldn't find a tool to, to make new art for her. And so we said, all right, let's, let's go ahead and build this for her. Um, and so she was one of the big inspirations. So we really liked being able to help her and she, we sent her those. Like we, we showed on the slides, another artist who we sent his NFTs and he said, oh, these are wild. I want to like sell them to my, my fans. Um, another interesting use case for this, imagine is you're a young company and you actually want to give NFTs to your first users as incentives for signing up. Um, what they would currently have to do is manually generate or draw existing art. What this will allow them to do is, for example, generate 10,000 new images that they can sell as NFTs to their first customers. So that's another use case we've, we've been exploring as well. Yeah. So if you were to continue working on this and, and putting time into the model, what improvements do you think you would make and, and what direction do you think you'd take it in? Yeah, in terms of, uh, well, you want to talk about improvements to the model and I can talk about like, you know, integrations and stuff. Well, I, I guess I was going to mention integration. <laughs> but I think a lot of the stuff that we can kind of like work on improvement is actually like round um, the model itself. So like, for example, having m multiple different like collections besides just like the board Apes and the CryptoPunks. Um, being able to actually like like send a whole like create a whole like ten thousand like image collection and be able to like automatically then kind of connect that to through some maybe open C API and like mint them directly mint them directly like just handle the whole process there from your initial images to like getting them act actually be NFTs and such yeah. images yeah kind of another thing in terms of like the the quality correction is we could actually implement feedback so like the of the images you selected we send those back and improve the model based on like what were the the positive examples versus the negative examples. Um, and essentially now we could use the positive examples as another input to the model and create kind of like a second degree combination or third degree combination. Um, something we're exploring, but you know, wanted to keep the demo pretty short. So, yeah. Uh, not sure if you're on Zoom, but uh, question for you, like how do you fix the style of a specific artist or like certain features to fix and others to change? Like you see like how these are usually a collection. So how do you maintain that uh, consistency? So I think if I heard correctly, the question was, how do we maintain the style of the artist? Is that, is that yeah, and, and sometimes you want to fix a few things, like you might want to fix the same face orientation, but change things like accessories and uh, colors in the background and so on. I see, yeah. Yeah, I think where that comes in is like, for example, in the board apes, um, in that sense there, like we have the content images already there. So like the content um, is kind of, is already there provided and you're just transferring the style of these images, of these like uploaded images onto them. So a lot of like the similar features of the collections are maintained just from using those content images. Um, yeah, I hope that answers the question. Yes, thank you. Any other yeah, questions? Uh, not a question, but it's actually really cool. Um, I think, well, anything could be NFTs, but traditionally things that have sharp edges and stuff usually uh, start to turn. I think if you fix the sharpness issue, this could be really cool. Um, I actually know a couple charities where they create art themselves but they, they're trying to combine it. This would be a great way to do that. And then they're trying to sell it as NFT and then all the funds go right back to the charity. But people buy those NFTs. Yeah, I would love to contribute to charity. Can, yeah. uh, but Send them over the link. Yeah, I think it's an awesome, awesome job. Guys. Yeah, appreciate it. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much to the first group for starting very strong. It was a very interesting project.
And reminder once again to please come up to the stage and start setting up when the previous group is uh, answering questions. And now let's welcome the second group, emo Emotify. <laughs> Awesome. All right. Hello, 329S students and judges. We are Modify, and we are beyond excited to show you our project today. Make the next slide. Uh, so really quickly, we'll just go over the team. So me, DT, and Onfall are all master students in computer science, and we took this class in hopes of bolstering our ML theory knowledge with some practical, uh, practical methods and deployment methods. Next slide. Uh, so first, why emojis? Um, so if we look at the graph on the right, we could easily see that since the advent of major social networking platforms like Twitter and Facebook, emoji usage has been growing pretty steadily to the point where it's at today, where almost a quarter of all tweets contain at least one emoji. Uh, next, according to several studies that have been done over the past couple of years, including an emoji in a tweet can increase your engagement by up to 25%. And as more and more companies are moving uh, their ad revenue towards platforms like Twitter and Facebook, uh, engagement is their key metric. So it could really, really be a, a huge use there. Um, and last but not least, emojis are a lot of fun and they can be used by everyone. So there's really no barrier to entry. Um, and so our overall goal is to make the process of choosing the right emoji easy, quick, and intelligent with the help of ML. And Onfall is gonna take us away with the... <laughs> yeah, so for the MVP, we use something called Tweemoji dataset and our baseline model consists of a BERT encoder plus a classification head across the set of emojis that we supported. And we fully trained through the model all across all the layers. Next slide, please. Very briefly, this is the diagram, system diagram for our first iteration. Next slide. A lot of problems touching all the different sort of pain points. Great example here of what was wrong with the MVP. That movie was a dumpster fire. If we tried to emojify that, we got a laughing face emoji. If we said the movie was amazing, we got the laughing face emoji. And in any situation, we got the laughing face emoji. So clearly there's stuff wrong, but we iterated. We had a reboot of our ML and we switched from Tweemoji, which we realized was really poor quality, to the higher quality tweet eval data set, which was smaller, but better curated. And we actually, instead of using vanilla BERT, leveraged a variant of BERT that was pre-trained on Twitter text. So it was way more domain aware and we also did an extensive hyperparameter search using Raytune. Next slide. So here's the system diagram for v2.0 of a Modify. So briefly, we train the model using PyTorch and Hugging Face APIs. Once we have the model, we expose it in Python using a Hugging Face pipeline to make it easy to work with. Then we dockerize that, or we exposed it for API consumption first using a Flask app. And then we dockerize that Flask app and the ML model together. And we deploy that container on Google Cloud Run to have an API endpoint that could be used for inference. Now, we deployed our Streamlit app on Streamlit Cloud, and we had a Google Chrome extension. So a user input could be taken in. We send an API request to our API endpoint to get an emoji prediction, as well as the probability distribution over all the emojis. And let's see these both in action in the demo. Awesome. So I'm going to switch over to the demo. Also note that you can find this link Thank you. You can find the link to our web application on Ed if you want to play along uh, with us. So let's get started. Um, say you're on an average day on Twitter. You just got back your final project grade for 329S and you got 100% and you're super excited. So you want to tweet, I got a 10 out of 10 on my final project. Now, clearly, you're very happy about this, so that's awesome. Um, now, say later on that day, you're on uh, Tinder, and you want to tell somebody that they're very cute. So you say, you're a 10 out of 10. Same keywords, but now we have a winky face, <laughs> right? Um, so let's say that you are super frustrated with um, how hot it is outside, and you're like, oh, my gosh, it's like 100 degrees outside. You modify, you see this fire emoji. Now let's say you're a grad student like myself and uh, you're frustrated with how many degrees you have and you say, I have like five degrees. You modify and it's laughing at my predicament. <laughs> so um, now this is clearly great for an average user. Let's switch to advertisers and uh, business professionals. So you might want maybe uh, not just one prediction, but a couple of probabilistic distributions over these various emojis we offer. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch and show you a couple of tweets that we've pre-selected. So the first is Brilliant Earth. They're a jewelry company. Now, of course, it's very apt that they're using the sparkling emoji here because we love our jewelry to be sparkly. 
But notice that in this text here, there are no keywords that indicate jewelry or sparkles. However, when we modify, we do see that our model is able to get that sparkling emoji. Now say that you are Jurassic Park. You're trying to put out an ad to get people to ooh and awe over your baby stegosaurus. We actually uh, pull out sentiment from small pieces of text very well as well. So if I just take that first sentence and click to emotify, I get that heart eye emoji. Um, and then finally, of course, our model only predicts one primary emoji. However, um, it can be great to leverage our probabilistic distribution in the following manner. So let's say that I take the text from this pentatonics post that has two emojis in here. I emotify. You, of course, see the Christmas tree here, but you also see the second most likely emoji is that sparkle. And that is exactly what we have in the post. So uh, with that, we would love to open it up to some of your inputs or take any questions. This was really cool. Um, as more and more Apple's updates, like half of them become about introducing new emojis, do you, know how, do you guys know how you might account for new objects or new or even combinations of emojis that we haven't seen yet? Um, yeah, so as part of our actual like final project write-up, the one thing that we wanted to do more if we had like a couple extra weeks is implement some continual learning techniques. Mm -hmm. So, you know, right now, like this is just like a static data set, but uh, we wish to add a couple of things like one first uh, user input. So like we'll give the suggestion and if they like it, you know, give a thumbs up. Awesome. If they don't like it. They could input like a possible emoji that at least like they thought would be best and then we mm -hmm. kind of add the training set yeah. and then like you know set up some cron times maybe like update every every once in a while so on and so forth we also were looking to increase the size of our data set because right now we just had that small forty thousand example data set mm -hmm. where we're looking into like different ways to get like good quality data and like unsurprisingly <laughs> it's really hard to get good data off twitter just because it's an absolute like fire yeah. going on there but we're thinking okay maybe getting uh, like verified users only or something like that, just with a better piece of data. So th th those are like the couple of techniques we're looking at. Okay, thank you so much for the second group. That was a really cool demo and I encourage you all to try it out in your own free time. So unfortunately due to time constraints, we're going to have to limit the number of questions that each group is going to be able to take. So it's going to be a limit of two questions per group. And also Megan will give you hand signals when there are three minutes left and where there is one minute left. So please look to her for signals. Okay, that's welcome to third group, news flow. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Jenny and I'm a CS major. Hi, I'm Gordon, I'm also a CS major. I'm Will and surprisingly also a CS major. <laughs> um, and we're in news flow. Uh, so recently, we've seen a surge in day trading where traders will make, uh, will buy and sell stocks multiple times a day. And for these traders, they need to understand and react to breaking news very quickly because these news reports often cause market changing behavior. And these um, traders have to be able to read the whole story, but that takes too long. But if they try glancing at the headline, they could make a misleading um, decision. And oftentimes, in order to analyze the contents of the articles, they need to have some kind of background information about the situation, whether it's like a war, some kind of shortages, anything like that. And this is where news flow comes in. So we are a useful middle ground. Uh, we provide augmented headlines, which are a headline plus a summary and an opinion on what stocks will be affected by each article, as well as the direction that we predict that they'll move in. And these are all generated in real time using our AI software. Um, so to go over our specific flow chart, we begin by scraping articles and summaries using Alpaca AI and from Wall Street Journal. And for each of these articles and summaries, they are fed into our machine learning pipeline, which generates relevant stock tickers, sentiment predictions, as well as reasoning for why the stock would move in that direction. We also find similar articles so that these traders can have not only one source, but multiple to make their decisions off of, as well as keyword extraction so that these traders can immediately know like what is most relevant to them and the stocks that they hold. And these are stored as a JSON and deployed um, as an API using AWS Cloud and then read by the front end to make an interactive front end for the trader to use. 
Uh, so for features, we have a few main um, concepts. The first one is a price prediction. So we give a ticker um, and then we tell whether it's bullish or bearish. And this label usually has an explanation. So this is generated with GPT-3 and we'll explain the reprocess of this later. And if you don't trust what our predictions say um, or keep it as a guideline, we also have other things that you can take into consideration. We have keyword extraction and this uses the burst assemble model to extract keywords and phrases. We also have a related articles and um, we use the FITE index for uh, efficient similarity search and distal BERT for clustering of dense vectors. And we also can filter news articles by tickers so that it's easier to read a bunch of information regarding a single stock you require. So regarding GPT-3 price predictions, I think the first thing to um, ask is why and what is the challenge of this? Um, well, the idea is that GPT-3 is really useful compared to sentiment analysis because it has a lot more information regarding um, contextual information. Like it's not only able to get sentiment, but it's also able to tell you that if something is about oil, then you can talk about a lot of these oil companies that already have appeared in the data set. And we've experimented with many different prompts to try and get the best information. We experiment with double prompts, we experiment with more, um, more news information, double shot, and we decided that single shot information predictions work better than no shot prediction. And so our prompt format usually comes in the form of we give an example news source, we give it news um, title and summary, and then we have it generate stock predictions. And our outputs always look like this. Uh, we ran some back testing. And so basically what we're saying is that on a given day, we're looking at around a, um, so we basically experimented with 1556 trades over two years. Um, so this comes around from a thousand articles or so, and we estimate very good growth over this period of time. And even if we do make a less optimistic saying that we make around like $4 per trade, given what we said here, um, the volume of the trades that we are um, generating and all show that we are making a positive input. And so this is something that can be trusted. Great. Yeah. Now it's time for uh, a quick demo. So uh, this is Newsflow. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you can see for a given news story, we have uh, the headline uh, and, you know, a quick summary and the timestamp. Um, and then we have our AI predictions. So uh, we predict, as, as Gordon mentioned, uh, tickers along with, uh, you know, directions. And we also are able to give users an explanation for the predicted directions. Um, what's really interesting here is uh, unlike, you know, a simple model or some, even some deep learning sentiment analysis model, we're actually extracting tickers that aren't explicitly mentioned. So for instance, here, the New York Times is not mentioned, um, but, you know, nonetheless, <laughs> it's, uh, it's included as a bullish prediction because GPT-3 has the world knowledge to realize that uh, New York Times is a competitor of USA Today. Um, and these uh, links, you know, route to Yahoo Finance. Um, we also have related articles, which was using the uh, Distilbert and Face Index. And these also route to the original article. And then we extract key phrases. So um, something I can also show you is filtering. So let's say we're really interested in, uh, you know, oil and gas trading. So we want to filter by ExxonMobil. So then here we can see uh, only stories that have predicted ExxonMobil as a ticker. And, and Gordon, do you want to do a deep dive into this example? Yeah, so as we mentioned, the most important thing about GPT-3 here is that it's able to extract information that isn't relevant or hasn't showed up in explicitly in the article. So here we have something about Ukraine-Russia war and how it uh, sparks gas price increases. And obviously this has had an impact on oil prices. And so we have these predictions for a bunch of different um, oil companies, which they think um, will change in this meantime. So um, a few looks at this show that we do have similar um, results for other news articles as well. Um, and yeah, uh, I think this is it for what we have on the side of the demos. Um, let us know if you guys have any questions and we'll be very happy to answer them. How, how did you work around the token limit in the GPT-3 request? Sorry, can you repeat the question again? Yeah, how did you work around the token limit for long articles? Right, so, okay, so the token limit. Yeah, this is a good question. So um, we experimented with a lot of different lengths of tokens. So um, for this one, I think the most useful thing to know is that um, when we look at the Alpaca API, most of the news sources are around like two sentences long, which really help us out in terms of experimentation. Um, otherwise, like in... Like in terms of like bottlenecks, we do acknowledge that like the fact that GPT-3 does charges is um, kind of a detriment in terms of making larger back testing results that uh, we would hope to present. Um, but 
reasonably given the amount of money that we have uh, committed, this is probably um, the strong result. I, I, meant, I meant the uh, maximum uh, length of the document. Oh, maximum. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Um, well, the answer is we've run through experiments um, with a single shot experiment. I don't think we will um, usually overcome this. Um, so we don't usually encounter this issue. Um, we've set the predictions such that um, like usually we get around like three to four. Um, but we'll definitely look into uh, seeing how we can work around this in the future. Thank you. Yes. You guys have a way, so if one article is bullish on Exxon, but another article is bearish, you aggregate like the results across different articles. Um, or how do you deal with like the, the labeling problem there? One article is positive. Yeah, um, that's a good question. Um, so regarding like back testing and results, um, what happens is uh, we basically give an assumption that like if we have like five articles and three say it's like bullish and two say it's bearish, we get somewhere close to where um, the actual stock prediction is. So we don't make any um, changes regarding like a single article. And but we do think that it's valuable to like just for like a single stock say like oh like this is what this single article is um, pointing towards. And I think that is a valuable information in itself, because if you're trying to aggregate a lot of information, and this is something that news traders will have a harder time like dissecting, right? It's very good for a news trader to look at a single news source and be like, oh, Wall Street Journal says this, and Wall Street Journal, um, the sentiment from this article is something that's good. Um, so we don't want to be able, like, we want to keep that authenticity. We don't want to scramble it up with other news sources. Okay, thank you, Newsflow. And now let's welcome the next group, AutoShop. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Gabe, and I'll start talking a little bit about our app, AutoChef, which is a computer vision and somewhat kind of recommendation system powered um, app application that helps to match ingredients for, uh, to a recipe. So I am Gabe, as I said, and my two teammates here are Jung Ha and Sharon. Sharon and I are CS majors, Jung Ha is a stats major, and um, I'll get into the application. So the most important thing uh, driving our application was the value proposition. We, when discussing ideas, we all three of us kind of um, this idea of uh, minimizing food waste kind of resonated with us, uh, and it's kind of a, an issue on on two levels. It's a personal level issue. It's just you kind of feel bad about yourself when you're wasting food. It's annoying when you have food left over in the fridge and it's spoiling and throwing it out kind of sucks. But it's also a, a kind of a grander, large scale issue, right? Like. Um, uh, organization called Feeding America estimates that about 40% of food in the U.S. actually ends up going to waste, and you know no one consumes it. So kind of a kind of a big issue. Uh, we'd like to address that, and uh, to do so, our our key objective was to make an application that will help to users to get I don't know give give them creative ideas as to what to do with their with their leftover ingredients that would go bad otherwise. And so our proposed solution is AutoChef which is intended to be a mobile application, you know, for the convenience aspect. For the sake of this class, because we none of us know how to do mobile development, we did a web application. But the idea is still there. Um, so AutoChef, you, you take a picture of some leftover ingredients in your fridge with your phone, and it will match those ingredients to some recipes. Um, and I'll briefly go over the system layout here. So at the beginning, we have user input, which is into a web application, as I had mentioned. And then we have an I, our ingredient identifier, which is simply a um, an object detection model that's hosted in Google Cloud. And from there, we're going to get a list of ingredient names, and that will go into a an API called Spoonacular, which, given a list of ingredients, is kind enough to return uh, recipes for us. And then uh, we can use those those recipes uh, to further refine those that list and and actually rank them. Um, Currently, we're, we're doing that a little bit um, kind of simplistically based on just the number of ingredients used, essentially, or the number of ingredients missing, like the minimum number of missing ingredients. So like if you have all the ingredients, then for a recipe, that will be at the top of the list, which makes sense, obviously. But we also want to think about user preferences in the future, and that's where a more Rexis component would come in. Um, and then finally, of course, we have the, the front end of the web app, which displays the results in a kind of nice manner, which is great. All right, I'll pass on to John. Yeah, so for our MVP initially, our model could only detect basically one ingredient at a time. So the photo would only have to have one ingredient there. 
So that's not exactly uh, useful, but that was our MVP. And we also couldn't really filter our recipes um, on, based on other filters just beyond simple ingredient selection. And lastly, because we wanted this app to be one-stop shop, it would be helpful to have recipe instructions, but we didn't have that for the MVP. But in our current iteration, we've basically added a bunch of conveniences. First of all, our model importantly it detects multiple ingredients at once. Secondly, the recipes can be filtered based on the different cuisines, the different dietary restrictions that you might have, specific intolerances, as well as the type of dish that you want to cook. And lastly, if you click on a specific recipe, it can also give you detailed recipe instructions as well. And now Sharon should demonstrate what that would exactly look like. Cool. Oh. <clears throat> All right, sounds good. So first of all, we start off with the AutoShift login page. Uh, you can register yourself as a user, and then you can you can go ahead and get started. Uh, I've already registered myself, so I'm just going to go ahead and log in. Um, we we actually initially planned on not having the login stage because it, it, we wanted it to be something that everyone could use. But then again, we thought of adding in a recommendation system so that we could add in personal recommendations later on down the stage. Uh, and we do have that, but it's not exactly ML based. Uh, we we also <clears throat> could have thrown in things like collaborative filtering in there, which could have uh, further enhanced this enhanced it. So this is just uh, the login stage is something we decided to add on. So okay, well, you've gone ahead and created a web application. You can go ahead and upload a photo. Uh, let's pick this one, and then so we have a lettuce, an avocado, and a cucumber. Uh, <laughs> Okay, zucchini. Uh, okay, so you, you can see that the detected ingredients are all correctly recognized by the object detection model here. Uh, <clears throat> we actually parse these as checkboxes because we wanted to take into account for uh, the model failing in some cases, in case it failed to detect an ingredient or whether it you know misclassified an ingredient. We also added a we also added a text box here for manually adding ingredients uh, in case ingredients are missed or in case. You couldn't like bother to take something out of the fridge, put it on a table, take a picture. So let's add, I don't know, kale and tomato. Um, cool. And then you can obviously like unselect or select whatever you want. And we also added uh, typically pantry items as a checkbox. This is for typical items uh, that are every household has, like salt or milk or whatever. Uh, so let's include those and let's include recipes. I'll take a second, but. Uh, here you can see that all the recipes are the suggested recipes are here. You can go ahead and start filtering them. Uh, let's pick American uh, diet, vegetarian intolerance. Let's say sulfite. I don't know shellfish. Uh, and then meal. Let's pick salad because I prob we probably wanted to make salad in the first place based on ingredients. We filter it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you can see that the recipes are all filtered based on the ingredients. And here you can view the list of used ingredients, the additional ingredients you need to make the recipe, as well as a, as well as the summary of the recipe itself. Uh, in let's say you keep using this for a long time. You don't want to keep wasting calls to the API, stuff like that for convenience. You can also go ahead and favorite recipes that show up on the left toolbar. Uh, and then you can go ahead and click on a recipe in order to view instructions on how to prepare it. Uh, and then again, yeah, you can also view the same recipe from the favorite recipes page. And that is pretty much how AutoShip works. Any questions? I guess not. <laughs> Just for kidding. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to AutoChef. And now we have misinformation detection application. Okay. All right, nice to meet you all. My name is Ricky Granis Boo, and we're excited to present our misinformation detection application to you. Hello, guys. I'm Will. Hi, my name's Arden. All right. So to start off, big problem of late: the spread of misinformation in online communities poses significant challenges for society from causing medical harm during the COVID-19 pandemic to propagating election misinformation, which, as we've seen, can have huge real-world consequences. So, well, larger tech companies sometimes have the ability to employ huge teams of human moderators. This is pretty inaccessible, time-consuming, and costly for smaller online communities who don't have the means to employ these large teams of human moderators. We also have 
auto moderation systems, which large tech companies can employ. However, these are typically very closed off, proprietary, and largely inaccessible to smaller online communities. So our goal is to our goal is to help developers of online communities stop the spread of misinformation on their platforms at low cost by creating a machine learning application capable of automatically detecting misinformation in these online posts. And to make this easier for smaller developers to integrate in their solutions, we provide a simple, straightforward API call, which can be easily integrated into any existing application. And to allow developers to test it out as well, we've also created a web application publicly available online, which allows developers to easily try out our solution prior to trying to integrate it into their system. Now, one interesting problem we also faced was, since many pieces of misinformation are highly political, users may disagree with our model's decisions if we do not provide adequate and reasonable explanation for them. So for this reason, our model also returns a relevant and link to a reputable news source which provides context and explanation for why our model is making a decision. And I'll pass it over to uh, Will now, talk through our model architecture. Uh, on that end, um, this is kind of like the high level system design that we came up with. Um, so we would start with an API request and then that request would get processed into this overall system. Um, that will be explained a bit more in detail later with the demo. Um, we would pre-process this text and then convert them to embeddings. And then with these embeddings, we would be able to make a prediction. But then as Ricky just stated, like we would need to provide some explanation with this prediction. And we would take these embeddings and the other embeddings that we've made uh, with the training samples, and then we would provide the closest, um, uh, closest neighbors using KNN. And then we provide these examples and the prediction back as the API response back to the user. So from the user's perspective, you can see it's a fairly easy interaction with the system. So we try to kind of gear toward that as well. Um, so it's very, fairly simple. You get, you provide a request and then you'll just get back a response from our system. Um, and moving on. Cool. So I'll talk a little bit about some of the technical details that make our system work. Um, so I guess like the main point is that we wanted to build a system that was explainable, scalable, and also allowed us to iterate very quickly over it. So kind of the key um, integrations that we use for this is weights and biases. So kind of what happens in a training loop is we'll generate a bunch of logs and then we'll generate what we call like an art or what they call an artifact, which you can think of just as like a deployment object that has um, an associated tag and version. Um, and this is helpful because uh, along with that, we'll, we'll log in the metadata of the artifact, things like hyperparameter configurations, uh, training metrics, et cetera. So that if someone has like a question about our model, we can, um, you know, point them towards this and tell them exactly how we trained it and like um, everything about it. Um, and this also is really nice for the actual deployment because um, with this sort of tagged artifact, what we can do is we can just specify the artifact name, pull it down from the cloud, and then deploy it directly on a GCP using um, our fast API front end and then um, our racer back end, which allows it to scale it out. Um, and then as mentioned, we have like uh, a bunch of API calls that the client can use and then also um, a web application that I will uh, demo in case someone wanted to use it. Um, sort of interactively. Um, so this is like the, the general interface of our Streamlit application. Um, you can type a query, leave some feedback, et cetera. But um, mainly what it's meant to do is just wrap sort of the, uh, um, the API calls. So here you can see what happens when you get a predict API call. Um, you know, it shows us the predicted label. It gives you kind of your sources, similarity scores, um, et cetera, and also allows you to leave feedback such as, um, you know, if, we, if you think that we did something wrong, you can uh, leave like a, what you think the right label is, and then we'll sort of take that into consideration. Um, you can do other things like request model information, um, which gives you like the, the artifact tags and everything. Um, and yeah, that's, that's like mostly it. Um, and maybe we'll move on to questions. Yep. Thank you so much. Open any questions you have had. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we didn't go too much into detail about the model architecture, but actually, like, part of the prediction, it like uh, it associates basically um, like your generated embedding from your query with 
uh, an embedding in our database, which has like an associated uh, source and label. So then we provide those. Um, so it, it kind of happens at prediction time where we get the sources. Uh, I may have missed this, but is there a way you classified the misinformation or is that um, just yeah, like, how do you validate that? Yeah, sorry. So um, uh, we didn't go into too much detail, but okay. basically what happens is we have so, a list of sort of like sources and like um, source content and we build sort of an embedding space uh, of mm. the sources uh, okay. along with their labeled um, tag. So then at inference time, we'll compare like your generated query embedding against this um, index set and then use a, a little voting scheme to figure out um, what the label should be based on the classified examples that we have. Okay. And then that little, uh, the UX where they can give feedback is that, I guess in the future, maybe you can account for that to adjust some of those. Yeah, exactly. Okay. That's the plan. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. That's it. Thank you. All right. Thank you all so much. Okay, so that was misinformation detection application, and now we have the next group, box dogs. Okay, today we're presenting Vox Docs, a platform where users can edit audio by editing text. So let's say you're a podcaster and you just recorded an hour-long audio, but you made a mistake right in the middle. Ouch. Now you're going to have to comb through that entire audio, find your mistake, and then edit it out. More generally, when people are recording audio, they tend to make mistakes, as everybody does, and it's painstaking and very difficult to go through an entire audio file to find those mistakes, and hiring audio editors is pricey. So what's the solution? We have VoxDocs, an AI-powered tool to edit audio by editing text. This will save you time, as now you can simply look through the transcript and find where your mistakes are, and then delete those words, just like in a text editor. This will generate the corresponding audio with those snippets removed. This will also save money, as there's less need to hire professional editors to do these things for you. Finally, there's many applications, including podcasting, audiobooks, and voiceovers. Now, on to Tony for the demo. All right, so it's demo time. Um, let's just dive right into it. I'm on our homepage, VoxDocs.io, where users can upload an audio file of their choice. Let's take a listen. The goal of contrastive representation learning is to learn such an embedding space in which similar sample pairs stay close to each other while the similar ones are far apart. All right. Um, with our generated transcript, users can either remove individual words like this or an entire phrase at once. And when you're done, and when you're done just click export. The goal is to learn such an embedding space in which similar sample pairs stay close to each other. All right, not bad, but what about another audio snippet? Let's do one more. The volume higher. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, all right, we'll just go with it. Sorry. <laughs> Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. All right, since it's 2022 and you know, not 1863, maybe we can remove uh, the first phrase. Um, and this will work fine. But what if, as a user, I also wanted to add text? And now you can. And instead of saying four score and seven years ago, we can say 246 years ago. And it's as easy as that. And our AI model on the back end will generate an audio snippet based on your unique audio profile. 246 years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. All right, so that's our demo. Um, 
Quick question uh, here. Sorry. Actually, one more thing about the demo. We've also enabled users to upload uh, videos so that they can edit video by editing text. So you can fix that pes pesky error when you're recording your presentation. And I'll pass it off to Daniel to talk about the modeling. Now, let's talk about the modeling. For audio transcription, we use Celero. And as you can see from the demo, this allows quick and quality transcription. For empirical use evaluation, we also tested more of our own sample recordings and found that transcription is high quality. For voice synthesis, we use paddle speech. While paddle speech has provided pre-trained models for Chinese language generation, this was not provided for English. So we used an English data set and trained on this to get English voice cloning. The three components of voice synthesis include an acoustic model, fast speech two, um, a vocoder, parallel wave GAN, and a uh, voice cloning, which is GE2E. And then looking at the actual application architecture, we have a client application, an HTTP, HTTP server in Node.js, which serves basic HTTP requests, and then a model server in Python Flask, which is an API endpoint for basically the model. And so the reason we separate those is because we wanted to have two separate VMs to be more like efficient, because the model needs more computation, whereas the small node doesn't really need that much. And overall, we use Kubernetes so that later on, and we deployed a Google Kubernetes engine so that later on, if we want to scale this, we can, and we can, you know, just add more replicas basically of each of these pods. Um, and that's our application. And this is the team. So thanks, and we'll open it up to questions. I have to ask, because that's my domain, like how do you extract the speaker embedding and use it, or the style and use it in the TTS? <laughs> Sorry, can you repeat the question one more time? Yeah, sorry, for Zoom is not very really clear. How do you extract the uh, speaker embedding or style and use it in the text-to-speech task? Yeah, so I mentioned three components. Um, so the GE2E, which is generalized end-to-end -end, um, speech identification, that allows you to extract the speaker embedding. And then the fast speech 2 model, which is the acoustic model, is conditioned on its vector. And then with this conditioning, it's able to generate um, this voice based on that um, speaker embedding, which is a vector dimension. So that's how the conditioning happens. Uh, I have Another a question. really good question. Oh, sorry. Have you guys heard of uh, Descript by any chance? Oh, we pretty much created the open source version of that. They're a Series B, $50 million company. So this would be cool if you guys open source this and add more features. Yeah. Thank you. Can you go to one more question in Zoom? How do you scale this for multi-speaker input or any embedded background music in the audio? Do you have any ideas? I think for multi-speaker, this is currently a limitation, but um, we would want to figure out how we identify speaker first and then cut the audio based on the speaker and then generate separate embeddings for each speaker. And for background audio, um, we haven't tested yeah. I think I think for that we were, we were thinking about adding in like a noise removal step before we send to the model and then adding the noise in back maybe when we get it back and then like when we cut the audio we could just cut that portion of the noise as well um, but that would be like a future uh, step okay. that was a really cool demo um, thank you to Vox Docs and now we have spark. Okay, cool. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much. So I'm Nina, and this is Kuhn and Griffin, and this is our app Spark, which stands for Schedule Power and Reduce Carbon. Um, so to motivate the app, I'll just start by pointing out that every day we all make decisions in the household, like when to run a load of laundry, how long to take a shower for, or when to charge an EV. And all of those activities require using electricity, and as we all know, producing that electricity generates carbon emissions. So as someone who's a consumer of electricity, I'm interested in knowing how many carbon emissions am I responsible for when I do those energy-intensive activities, and is there a way that I can adjust my behavior in the household to reduce my emissions? So that's where Spark comes in and what Spark helps you to understand. Before we go to the demo, I'll just spend a few more minutes um, giving a little more context on how it works. So the amount of CO2 that's emitted depends on what's going on behind the scenes when the electricity is generated. So I'm just going to zoom in there for a little bit. Um, so electricity generation, as we all know, comes from many different sources. And at any given moment, the particular sources that are being dispatched to the grid is called generation mix. And it depends on a whole range of factors from resource availability to demand, market conditions, seasons, weather, et cetera. Um, so this is what that generation mix looks, look, looks like over time. So it's a breakdown of the energy supplied in megawatts per resource over a 24-hour period in California. 
So you can see, and what, given the generation mix, you can compute the amount of CO2 being emitted per kilowatt hour from the grid. So you can see that using energy at for certain times of the day can produce like a fifth of the amount of carbon as at other times of the day. Although the amount of carbon emitted depends on a lot more factors than just the time of day. And that's what we try to capture in our modeling. Um, here is our model solution. So uh, we start with getting the energy mix data and the weather data. Both are taken as time series. And for the model part, we use SK forecast plus SG boost for uh, regressor, and we retrain every hour. Uh, so we choose this specific architecture because it's simple. It's easy to retrain and continuously getting data. And, that, and, and we find that more, that's more important than uh, tuning the hyperparameters or using more complex models like NBeats or uh, transformers. And, and in the end, we output um, the uh, next 24 hours for different energy sources. So here are the six energy, source, energy sources we can comfortable uh, predict. And in general, we have an MAP error of plus or minus 8%. In terms of the architecture, we're looking at a pretty standard Google Cloud stack. We got serverless deployment. So if suddenly this gets super hot and everyone's hitting it, it's going to scale up automatically. And when no one's hitting it, which is most of the time, we have zero compute costs. Um, Streamlit front end is all free, which is great and really great uh, developer tools. And one kind of unique part of the platform is that we're retraining these models, actually six of them, every hour to get the mo to include the most recent generation mix data. So we just have a cron job that's going through hot swapping in these models, so that every time you hit the endpoint, you can be confidently getting the most accurate, most up to date prediction data. Great. Now we're just going to move on to the demo. So. Oops. Okay, so here's what our app actually looks like. Um, so when you first go in, the first thing you do is select an activity from this list of common household activities. So let's say I, I know I need to run a lo load of laundry today. Um, maybe when I get home, so I choose a time, maybe like around 7 p.m. Um, and I only need to run it for an hour. And I'm just gonna choose to use the default energy consumption of running a washing machine. Although if I know the specs of my particular machine, I can also go ahead and enter my own. But for now, I'm just gonna use the default. Then I hit generate forecast. And then what this does is in the back end is predict the generation mix at this particular time and use that to compute the CO2 emissions. So the model is telling me that if I run my load of laundry at 7 p.m. tonight, I'm expected to produce around 35.6 pounds of carbon, which according to this gauge is not that bad compared to like what it might be. Um, there's also a couple of drop downs. We can see a little bit more detail about the forecast results per, per energy source. And then this is the same view except in a bar chart form uh, from now for the next 24 hours. Um, and then if I also click on this one to see a recommendation, I can see that the model is telling me that instead of 7 p.m., the model is recommending maybe that I run my load of laundry at 5 p.m. to get a smaller carbon load. Um, I can also go back up and, and edit and play around with this. So maybe it's recommending 5 p.m. So I'll go back in and click 5 p.m., regenerate the forecast, um, wait a few seconds and see that the emissions went down a little bit. Um, yeah, so that's it. And happy to take any questions. Can you pull up the line chart real quick? Sure. I just want to see. Um, yes. Yeah, my, my, my question was like, did you did you think about showing a graph of like just the energy output by hour? So I'm like, I want to run the laundry tomorrow. Tell me when the best times are across the board. Yeah, so or, that's a great point. We we totally could do that. Although in our bar chart, there's really only one source of renewable energy, and then or there's primary source of renewable energy it's pretty obvious which are the bad ones you know like uh natural gas not not too good but you're right i mean pure carbon is probably what most people are going to be looking at yeah yeah so essentially to make the gauge when well, we actually calculate those numbers for the next 24 hours mm -hmm. Um, does your like predicted time actually like change depending on what task you input? Because uh, I guess like since I'm unfamiliar, I would imagine like the electricity for uh, your washing machine is probably the same as the electricity for your um, uh, drying machine. Yeah, yeah, um, definitely. So, what's the so difference? yeah, the gauge is like scaled based on like the typical range of loads for that particular activity. Yeah. Cool. Thank you so much to Spark. And just a quick reminder that we will be aggregating all the judges' scores for judges' awards at the end. And we will also be sending out a Google Forms at the end so that all the students can vote for your favorite projects. 
um, and there will be a Students' Choice Awards, both of which will be announced at the end um, of all the demos. So now let's welcome the next group, Polarity. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Tasso. Hi. I'm Joseph. So every day, we're constantly being fed new information, especially given how crazy the world is. And it's important to be informed, but it's also important to be informed in a fair way. Politically biased news sources, such as, for example, right-leaning Breitbart or Fox News, have the ability to alter people's perception of reality. Um, and our project, which we call Polarity, attempts to address this issue by hopefully helping people become more aware of the biases they, uh, they read from their news sources. Specifically, Polarity is a Chrome extension that is able to read a news article on the web and detect any liberal or conservative biases, and also highlight portions in the text that uh, particularly contribute to these biases. Um, so for the model, we use a fine-tuned Stilbert model, which we fine-tuned on news articles. Um, so with this, there isn't really like a good data set that gives good ground truth labels for, um, for uh, like the bias of news articles. So what we do as a proxy is take um, only traditionally very biased publications and use the actual publication itself as our classification label, as either liberal or conservative. And then the output of this model, we interpret as a political bias score to um, gauge how biased a particular article is that the user is reading. So for the actual system design, we trained on a Google Cloud VM and store the model artifacts in an AWS S3 bucket, and we deploy as a cloud function. So um, like as we mentioned, the actual UI is a Chrome extension. So when a user uses the extension, uh, it'll submit a request with the news article content to the cloud function, and the cloud function will return uh, bias scores for the article. And now I'll turn it over to the demo. Yeah, the yeah, I might, yeah. And just click into those links. Sure. <laughs> so, wait, actually, I might have uh, are these yes. things. Okay. Awesome. Okay. okay. All right. So, um, yeah, I'll just go over our model's performance on, uh, oops, on some uh, news articles from a handful of different sources with uh, different. Um, degrees of bias. So the first one is from Fox News, um, clearly a conservative leaning publication. Um, all you need to do to run Polarity is just click on uh, the Chrome extension and then analyze text. Very simple user interface. Oops. Then it takes a few seconds to run. Great. So we can see um, that the article leans very conservative as we expect. 
but you know, Fox News is actually part of our training data set, so you might wonder, you know, how well does this perform on, on other things? Does the model generalize? And indeed it does. So we go to this article from uh, Mother Jones um, that is uh, critical of President Trump. And uh, we can, again, analyze the text. Uh, just wait a few seconds. And whoops, I don't know why I need to, it doesn't usually disappear. But that's okay. Oops. Any idea why it's <laughs> disappearing? If you click out of it, it might. Oh, okay. <laughs> Not going to touch anything. Okay, great. So we can see that um, this article leans liberal. And more importantly, if you scroll down in the article, uh, you can actually should be able to find a section of the article. It is not here. For some reason, this was working on my Chrome, but that's fair. To be honest, I've actually have an older version of this up as well because I was not planning on using my computer to do this. Oh, okay. Um, right. So, yeah. Apologies for the technical hiccup, but when I ran it on my uh, laptop, uh, it the model actually highlighted this portion here, um, which uh, we, if we look at it, we can see that it's uh, critical of um, Donald Trump from um, John Bolton's point of view. And uh, similarly for this article, we had a we had a similar result. Uh, the highlighting doesn't seem to be working in Tassos, but when I ran it, um, it highlighted this first sentence: "Washington Free Beacon is a conservative publication," and um, they emphasized that this Democratic Senate Senate candidate struggled to name policies that uh, he helped implement. Um, and uh, we also ran this model uh, pretty extensively on neutral articles, so um, articles that may not contain explicit political bias from the um, United States sense or uh, articles that have nothing really to do with politics at all. And indeed, the, the model is able to you know, generally output um, neutral results. So uh, this is uh, an article from NPR about Russia uh, banning social media, and we can see that it is politically neutral, as we would expect as well as this um, cute uh, movie review of the new Pixar movie, Turning Red. Um, if we analyze that, this is also going to be about 50%. So that's sort of a, a little walk through the different types of uh, news articles that you can analyze using our article, and with the added functionality of being able to see what exactly about that article is, um, is, uh, attributing, is contributing to that, that decision. I promise the highlight part. So if you want to see it, we'll get nice later. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Any questions? Uh, so we haven't tried this on tweets as yet. The, our training data set and the examples that we've, we've run it on are, are based on news articles. And that's what our sort of backend is able to process because um, we, we use a, an external API that sort of converts uh, news uh, HTML to just a, the text and the format that our model can accept. Yeah. But that'll, that'll be sort of the next step. Can you have like some traces of keywords most like this? So I mean, at least when I run this, uh, articles that deal with um, uh, climate um, tend to lean liberal. Um, articles that uh, that I guess mention um, uh, you know uh, 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 you know uh, like Donald Trump things like that tend to learn conservative. Um, but uh, there aren't too many like specific, I guess uh, you know examples. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, so now we have our next group image quality ranker. Thank you. 
Okay. All right. Welcome to Photop, the new photo app for summarizing our highlighted experiences in life. Um, so I'm Kathan. I'm Patrick. I'm a Jew. I'm a Shara. And we will tell you about Photop today. So the motivation is essentially that the need for our project is, so this is my camera roll. And as you can see, I've taken a lot of pictures. Um, the underlying reality of these pictures is that they come from distinct experiences. So for instance, a graduation or a trip to the beach or a dinner party. And when we scroll back through these pictures, we actually want to scroll back through the highlights of our experiences. But with such a giant camera roll, this can be quite cumbersome. So enter Photop. So basically, uh, if we take this example, uh, maybe a vacation to the Bay Area, you might go to the Monterey Bay Aquarium, the Berkeley Rose Garden, and Stanford University. And those all kind of constitute separate experiences. So what Photop does is first, it clusters these images, separating them into sensible scene classes. And then within each scene, Photop will basically rank these pictures by their aesthetic quality. OK, so other photo applications like Google or Apple Photos, they can take a user's pictures and cluster them based on scene or things like facial recognition and whatnot. Google Photos specifically can take bursts of images and return like the top shot. Um, but our application is different because it can unify these two functionalities, the clustering and the image quality assessment ranking um, in, in very seamlessly. And also gives the user a level of control over the granularity of their results. So this was an earlier iteration of our product. Homepage, very simple. User uploads their pictures, but they don't have any um, choice of whether they want to you know, specify a number of scenes for their clustering or utilize the unsupervised clustering algorithm that we now support. And on our results page, you know, we just print out the results of our k-means clustering model and our initial image quality assessment ranking model. But obviously there's no visualization of the results and there's no way for the user to toggle between different clustering methods in an easy way. So how does the app work now? Um, currently, Photop takes as input from the user a set of images representing their camera roll and additionally gives the user um, an option to select either manual or, or automatic clustering. And then each image will go through two models in parallel. Um, first, each image will run through a scene clustering model to extract a feature vector, um, which is then used uh, to, um, to cluster the images based on semantic similarity. Um, this, yeah, the scene class classification feature extractor we use is ResNet 50, pre-trained on Places 365, and the clustering algorithm we use depends on whether the user opted for automatic or manual clustering. Um, if they selected manual, we use k-means um, based on the user inputted k. If they selected automatic, then we use the optics clustering algorithm. Um, and then in parallel with all of this, we also run each image through um, an image quality assessment model um, to obtain an aesthetic score to enable sorting within each cluster. Um, the IQA model we use is EfficientNet B0 fine-tuned on the iconic data set. And then additionally, we also cache the feature vector for um, the that's extracted using the scene classification model, and we ca also cache the aesthetic score so that um, if for future duplicate images, we don't have to recompute all those. Um, so in sum, our, our system outputs a set of clusters, um, each containing a set of semantically similar images sorted based on their aesthetic score. All right, and we'll jump into this demo here. Um, okay, just gonna jump right in. Uh, so there's a landing page for the application. Uh, it gives, it's pretty simple. Uh, it gives the user a chance to select automatic clustering, which you don't have to do anything with, or you can choose manual clustering, in which case you can enter the number of scenes you think the, the images that you're inputting might have. Um, we're gonna do automatic for the demo here. Um, so what I'm gonna upload is an album of me and uh, that we took uh, 
on a road trip to uh, Alaska National Park. Lots of similar scenes, real world examples. Uh, these images are pre-uploaded, but not pre-computed. So what you're seeing is live inference. We just wanted to upload it so that we didn't have to deal with the, uh, the internet. I'm just gonna go ahead and hit upload. As you can see, computation is pretty fast. That's both the image quality assessment and the scene clustering. And each of these images are the top picks from uh, each of the clusters that the clustering algorithm uh, uh, identifies. And if you click each, uh, each image, you'll see that all the images in that cluster uh, in order of um, quality or aesthetic score uh, are ranked, uh, are shown from left to right. Uh, we can go back, work through a couple of clusters here. Let's see this one. And as you can see, the underexposed image is supposed to be low quality. And click another one here. Once again, we have the same image on top, but the lower ranked one is overexposed on the bottom. So the image is actually, uh, the images are actually being ranked in terms of quality. Uh, and if you have a better idea of like, let's say I want to, I think there's 12 scenes in the data set. I can go ahead and write on manual regroup and it'll give me 12 different clusters uh, that I can pick from. Um, and as you can see here, um, we do have a lot of like semantic similarity in the images and we are seeing some, uh, uh, some reliable quality assessment happening here. But overall, that's kind of it for uh, the demo uh, for six weeks of work. We're pretty proud of what we've accomplished. And uh, thank you for listening. I mean, I know if you click it, you get closer, but like, are you guys laying them out on the page? This is randomly. So, kind of random. yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, try to do that. <laughs> I'm curious. Um, did you think about using location and like EXIF data for the clustering versus semantic similarity? So, yeah, the, you can really do it with metadata. Um, so a lot of the data sets that exist out there that do use clustering are like metadata based or like entirely like semantic based. So we kind of had to pick one unless we wanted to gather our own data, which is kind of a cumbersome process. But like plugging in the metadata uh, for uh, humans will, will actually help uh, a lot, uh, and uh, that'll be like the next step for us. Yeah. I think one feature of our demo we didn't show was that we actually included some pre-trained k-means where it can like basically split into some interesting semantic categories that wouldn't necessarily correlate with time. For example, a k-means that splits into like inside and outside images, which might be useful. How do you evaluate your system? So yeah, so we can evaluate like the separate components of each data set. So like if you're going to do like image quality assessment, we have like a test for that. We can do the places, uh, scene recognition, we have a test set for that. But when you evaluate them in concert, it's really like looking at the images and trying to understand like where it, why is it clustering and how it's clustering and like what parameters are affecting which one. So it's a lot of like manual analysis for us. Okay, thank you to Botop. And now we have our next group. Um, sounds like a very useful application, 911 Operator Assistant. Hello. Hi. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Dhruv. I'm Rajas. I'm Atharva. Yeah, and uh, we're working on the 911 operator assistant project. Yeah, so our problem statement is very simple. Uh, we want to build an application that can help 911 operators respond faster. Uh, we have found that on average, it takes around 11 minutes uh, for, for uh, a 911 operator to respond to, uh, to a call. And uh, past studies have also shown that uh, that uh, over 10,000 lives could be saved by even a one minute reduction in this response time. Uh, just to give you all uh, an, uh, an idea about the scale of this, uh, of this uh, uh, problem, uh, there are over 240 plus million people who, who call 911 every year. So I'll uh, hand it over to Regis for now, Regis, uh, to talk about the uh, data set and the uh, system design. Yeah, so um, according to federal law, if uh, anybody requests a 911 operate, uh, like 911 call, you need to put it on the internet. So we collected a data set of all of the 911 calls in San Diego that we could found, find. And I'll just uh, put one on just for everybody to listen to. Valley Road, Sunday, July uh, is it 3, 2, 2017. 
17, 23, and 48 seconds. Paramedics 317, what is the address of your emergency, please? Um, well, according to this, 14305 Valley Road. Okay, I, I think. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I think we, we're not able to. Make sure you have uh, put this on for everybody but yeah this is like a seven minute long call and um so um what we're going to do is we're going to process these 911 calls um so i'll just uh because this is a seven minute uh long call it'll take uh our system a little time to process this so while we're um talking about this i'll just put this on uh right yeah so so I just put, put that on the system. So what uh, happens in our system is that we can input a 911 call. And this goes through uh, the Google speech to text API for us to get the transcription of the call. And we run this through the translate API to get like a Google translation into languages like Spanish, because we've seen that there's a really big crunch in the uh, hiring 911 operators. So we can also, Spanish is the second most language spoken. And we, we feel like we can hire more people into 911 operators using this. We also do uh, live transcription, like as the call is going on, we can do the transcription along with, we do inference using named entity recognition, and we use uh, NLP models using pre-trained language uh, vectors to find out what, what is the emergency which is actually happening, what is the address of the emergency, what is the nearest help that you can get. And all of that we run through a Google Maps API to get like where, where we can actually you know, find this and find the closest route to the hospital. So I think while we were going on, um, we can see here that um, the model has done a transcription of the whole uh, call on the left. And it's uh, on the right, you can see that the, um, this is going through a uh, translation to Spanish. And on the right, you see that uh, our model has figured out the address of the emergency and you can see here that this is the address of like, this is the address to Kali. This is the nearest hospital marked by H, the nearest police station marked by P. You can find the closest help that the person can get along with distances. And we have some advice for uh, what the 911 operator can ask the um, Kali. And along with this, uh, like uploading a file for the uh, 911 call you can also have like a live transcription of a model and so for this we'll have Dhruv uh, act as a colleague and let's see how, how that goes so I, I'll just start the mic hi uh, I'm at 737 campus drive Stanford uh, there is a person in front of me who's bleeding I think they were in an accident can you please send me some help uh, okay yeah. we need to Sorry, what's the point of translating to Spanish? Oh, that's to increase the number of people we can hire as operators. And if they speak Hi, Spanish. I'm at 737 Campus Drive. Uh, there's a person in front of me who's uh, bleeding. I think they were in an accident. Uh, can you please send me some help? Okay. Uh, They did find that they were in an accident. I think the address, they were, he wasn't able to press the address. I can try it again later if you have more time. But yeah, uh, I can uh, answer that question, uh, answer any follow ups. Uh, uh, yeah, the Spanish translation just increases the access. Uh, uh, a number of people can use this application. Um, but then do you, do you translate it back if I'm, the person calling is mm -hmm. English, if I'm speaking Spanish, mm -hmm. do you translate in the other direction too? Right, so we weren't able to find any any data of people calling, uh, uh, of people speaking Spanish, of uh, calling speaking Spanish, or any other language. So we weren't able to test our system on that, and mm -hmm. that's why we uh, we were able to do that. But we think that it's easy to integrate and to do that if we have any time. Um, and then one question I had is, do you only take in an exact address, or did you guys, you know, explore like I feel like a lot of times when people call nine one one, they give a intersection or some landmark that they're near. Uh, did you think about incorporating that? Right. So yeah, in that case, I think we would highlight the landmark. Uh, right now, the idea is to highlight the landmark, and eventually we can shift to uh, including that information as well as so seeing near uh, near a certain intersection and things like that. But that's one of the future works, and I think we're about we're really going to discuss that now. Yeah. Uh, 
it's it's okay. Are there uh, classes of emergencies? Is that how you're able to give the advice, or is that case by case uh, based yeah, on what's so, said? Yeah, we have uh, classes of emergencies defined, and we're using uh, work to write models uh, to compare uh, compare the transcription, the uh, words that are uh, that are mentioned in the transcription to these classes, and then identify which emergency sure. was, uh, yeah took place. Gotcha. And one final part that I would like to talk about is the kind of evaluation criteria that we will be using. Uh, so there are two types of evaluation criteria. One is the system level evaluation criteria and the second one, uh, the model level uh, evaluation criteria. Uh, when it comes to the uh, system level evaluation criteria, our main task was to essentially cut down on the latency, uh, was to improve the response time of the 911 operator. So at EOD, we can always mimic, uh, mimic a system which would, I mean, we can have a system which would mimic a 911 operator and we can, we can essentially map how much time it saves as compared to the 911 operator. Uh, some other evaluation metrics that we thought about was uh, model centric evaluation metrics. Like, you know, uh, these days everyone uses metrics like precision recall and F1 for named entity recognition, which happens to be one of the most important um, tasks for our, uh, for our particular project. So these are the two main evaluation criteria which our project focuses on. And some of the uh, future work that uh, that we were thinking about is that essentially reducing the latency of this model, and uh, and and basically when it uh, when it comes to extraction of addresses, sometimes we we also observe that when the when the callee does not explicitly mention uh, mention their address, uh, they might uh, they might mention their address in a relative way. For instance, behind this building or beside this bridge. So how, how would we extract the address explicitly in that case? So these are the two fronts on which we would like to extend our future work. Do you have a mass slide you want to show? Oh, yes, yeah. we did have yeah, it. It was my bad. I it's okay. Right. okay. <laughs> Right. So, uh, yeah. So these are the evaluation criteria that uh, we were talking about. Uh, as in, the first three are you know are kind of like manual analysis that we can carry out, and the NER pertains to the model level evaluation criteria that we can uh, you know, evaluate at the end. Um, and yeah, this is the future work wherein uh, one other thing that I missed out on was uh, we would want to answer to as many 911 calls as much as possible. Uh, as Dhruv mentioned in the first slide, uh, an average response time is 11 minutes. If we decrease the human involvement or the dependence on humans on answering those calls, we would essentially be able to answer many more calls and thus thereby save many more lives. And that's what we eventually aim to do uh, by, by essentially improving the model's conversational ability. Uh, obviously, we wouldn't we wouldn't be able to deploy it right at, right from the outset. We would need some kind of a mimicking uh, schedule, and yep, that's that's another thing that we were thinking about. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to the nine one one operator assistant group. We really hope to see that put into production in the future. And now let's welcome the music recommendation group. Hello, my name is Kazuki. I'm Deep. And my name is Luke. So, oh, yeah. So imagine that you're listening to music and you come across a track that you really like and you ask yourself that uh, you, want more, uh, you want more songs with a similar energy level. So how, how would you go about this? Well, the two, two of the most popular uh, options that you have today is Apple Music and Spotify. Uh, both of these options require a $10 per month subscription plan, and their recommendation algorithms are not as customizable. For example, you can't say that I want a song that has the same danceability as this song that I really like, or the same energy level. So this is where our solution comes in. Uh, our solution is not only free, and it's also we can also customize the um, recommendations. So a high level picture, our uh, solution is accessible and also we can customize recommendations based on audio features and artists and release dates and so on. 
All right, uh, let's let's go over our amazing solution. Um, so, talking about the machine learning model behind it, uh, we started with the Spotify uh, Million Playlist dataset, which has songs until 2018. And at first, in our MVP, we deployed a, a single stage uh, collaborative filtering model, but it didn't work that well. So we came up with another model, which is a two-stage nearest neighbor uh, model, which has, uh, in the first stage, we take the user input and we do collaborative filtering to find the most relevant playlists that we have in our data set. And then we take the songs from those playlists and we pass them through the second stage where we use um, um, Features such as the popularity of the song, the energy of the song, to find the most similar uh, songs uh, similar to the user query, and then return them as recommendations. So we deployed this uh, model along with our Streamlit app on the Google App Engine, um, and we uh, so so the way the user interacts with this uh, is that there are multiple pages in our app, and the user can input their tracks. Uh, customize the recommendations. And we also have um, multiple interconnections between our app and different APIs, such as the Spotify API, to find the relevant um, song URIs. And we also have yeah interconnection to the model in order to send and receive uh, rec uh, recommendations of tracks. Um, the user is also able to customize the recommendation according to their energy level or artist choice. Um, and uh, we also have another feature where the user is able to provide feedback on if our recommendation was good or not. So they can select specific tracks and say that, yeah, I appreciate these recommendations and these match what I wanted. And we added another feature because our data set was limited to 28 until 2018. We wanted to have more uh, relevant songs to today and uh, to this year. So we wanted users to upload their own playlist so that we can expand our own data set and then retrain our model and deploy it on our app. Um, yeah, no, Kazuki will go over the demo. Okay. Thanks, Steve. And we will move on to our live demo. So to access our system, you just have to basically visit our website via the URL. And on the main page, um, you can use the text field to enter songs. So let's type in uh, Thinking Out Loud by Ed Sheeran. Um, we also try Just the Way You Are by Bruno Mars. Um, and you can all add more songs, but for the sake of time, we're going to stop there. And once you're done, you can click on the button to actually run our model. And it takes a few seconds to run, but um, you will eventually get um, 10 songs that are deemed relevant by our algorithm. So here they are. So the top two songs are All of Me and Photograph. Um, I think they're somewhat relevant, but realize that like they're somewhat like low in energy. So what if you uh, what if you want to have similar songs but with higher energy? So in that case, in order to achieve that, what you can do is navigate to the customization page from the sidebar, and this page provides multiple customizations. In our case, we want to uh, customize it so that songs are ranked by uh, energy level and in particular in descending order. So we change it like that. Uh, we can go back and rerun our model, and. We will see in a few seconds that this time we get a different set of recommendations. So um, here they are. So uh, notice that um, you know high energy songs like Marry You or Sugar are now towards the top of our list. And the two top songs that we had before are now, now not in our list. And once you get a recommendation, you can select songs that you think are good recommendations and uh, submit it so that we can use this later to use for evaluation online. And also, additionally, you can also click on the track name, uh, which is going to take you to the relevant YouTube page. So if there's a song available on YouTube, you can just listen it on YouTube. Um, the final component of our app is the um, capability for users to add their own playlist, as Steve mentioned. And in order to do that, just navigate to the last page. Um, you can type in songs to be in your playlist. And then you just have to like name the playlist. We'll call it demo, um, and then submit it. So this will be stored in our Google Cloud Storage. And later we can retrain the model with these new playlists so that um, first of all, it can achieve better performance. And second of all, as Steve mentioned, you can add new songs that were originally in the Spotify test. Mm -hmm. um, that's it for demo and thank you. Thank you. Any questions? 
Um, are those additional description axes like energy? Does that come with the data set? Uh, no, we basically choose them via the Spotify API. Um, oh, gotcha. Okay. I, I just saw a few, but do you know roughly how many there were on there? There are 10. Okay. Basically, um, it's limited by like uh, what Spotify guy provides. Okay. Oh, yeah. uh, very cool. Yeah. Uh, UX perspective, did you think about actually putting those into a playlist like a YouTube or Spotify? Or? I think that's like one potential extension, like picking out the like it has like a lot of things like Spotify or Apple Music and like have them export the recommendations to their own playlist. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Of course, they didn't get to that. Much. Right, thank you guys. Cool. So that was music recommendations, and now we have Legal Eagle. Hey everyone, I'm Shashank. I'm a senior in CS. I'm Bailey. I'm a co-chairman in data science. And I'm Lucas. I'm a co-chairman in CS. And together we made Legal Eagle. So Legal Eagle is an app where users can upload legal documents and get annotated versions of the same legal documents. Uh, the legal profession, for those of you who are not aware, is an incredibly lucrative one. Lawyers charge between five and nine hundred dollars an hour for most tasks. And about half of all work done at most law firms is contract review. Yeah, and another problem with this high cost is that many small businesses and individuals don't have access to uh, contract review services. Uh, so, and often contracts are very long and incomprehensible. So these people don't end up reading the contracts, uh, which can lead to predatory behavior. Yeah, and so for our project, uh, we made an app that takes as input a legal contract, then runs it through a deep NLP model and outputs labels and annotations for that contract. Uh, now we're gonna demo the app. So um, for the contract, oh, thanks. For the contract that we're gonna use, uh, we have this 12 page document that is actually the Chase Bank Affiliate Agreement um, contract. And here is our website. Um, so what we can do is we can add the data and we also have an option to add, upload a PDF file and then we'll process the PD, or process the input data. Um, note that this will actually take like 45 seconds or so because it's running um, or it's generating 40 annotation, 40 like label buckets for a 12 page document. So it, there's a lot of like, uh, processing that goes on, and we're also running it on GPU. Yeah, so we're while we're waiting for the GPU and friends, uh, in the course of doing our market research, we actually looked at some other companies that have tried to do similar things. Uh, one of them is this company called Clarity, based out of Boston. We uploaded the exact same contract on their website about an hour ago. About 20 minutes later, Lucas got an email. Uh, let's look at what annotations they have. Um, cool, so it seems like they found a clause that had to do for uh, with termination for convenience, that's cool. Um, yeah, and then there's like warranty, liability cap, so on. Um, essentially, there are a bunch of categories that we are looking for and they're looking for. Uh, and now let's see what legally. All right, so by now our algorithm has finished running um, and we can see that the results are displayed in this two column format. So on the left is the original text from the contract and on the right are the annotations. Uh, if you scroll over, the annotations, you can see where in the text they occur. Um, and we can see that we have a lot of annotations. Um, I think we have about 20, which greatly outperforms clarity, um, which we think is really impressive. And then looking at the annotations themselves, we can see that we have some simple um, annotations such as like document name and agreement date. But uh, scrolling down, we also have more complicated labels, such as a most favored nation clause, as well as exclusivity um, exclusivity terms. And then um, scrolling down all the way to the bottom, we have an option to download the data as a CSV file. Yeah, so to end our demo, we'll shortly talk about what uh, about our model and what makes it special. So we mostly use BERT-based transformer models, which are pre-trained on a large language corpus. And then we fine tune them using legal contracts that have very high quality uh, annotations. And then doing some research on this field, we realized that recall is much more important than precision. So um, 
you if you use our website, you'll actually realize that there are many like false positives, but that is okay because these lawyers normally to to like analyze this 12 page document would probably spend over an hour. So it's pretty easy for them, especially lawyers to switch uh, to just sift through the false positives and throw them out. Uh, and then finally, we structure this as a SAT style reading comprehension task. So uh, basically, th this is called like a question answering task uh, in the machine learning world. So to conclude our presentation, I'm actually going to show you an example quest question that we feed into the model. So for example, for the most favored nation clause that we showed you guys, um, this is exactly the string, like the text that we feed into the model. So we're explicitly asking the model to highlight uh, portions of the text. So uh, behind the scene, actually, the model is learning uh, how to find relevant spans of text uh, when given a question, which is uh, pretty impressive. Yep. And uh, yeah, overall, we're really excited about this and excited to see the model in the future. Thank you, guys. Thank you. You mentioned there's 40 different classes that you're looking for, and then you try various text span lengths as well, or is it per paragraph or section? Yeah, so to give more details of how it works, we use a sliding window approach approach okay. because it's like impossible to fit like yeah. feed in pages into a BERT model. So for each um, for each sliding window, we run that through 40 questions, and the model predicts. Uh, a start token and an end token. Hmm. Uh, and then we didn't talk about it, but there's also the model doesn't necessarily always give a prediction. If there's no predic prediction with like good confidence, then it will say it will just not output the answer. Awesome. Yeah. This sounds something like it's useful for some legal experience, but even cooler break down the jargon for uh, for amateurs to understand what that means too. But yeah, awesome job. What kind of contracts uh, do you support in terms of like, like even types? Have you looked into like, the different classes of agreement types as input distribution? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So our, uh, our pre-training data set, uh, we looked at a lot of SEC filings, rental agreements, uh, the credit card agreement we, we went through in the demo. Um, in general, we think it's pretty extensible and there's, there's uh, specified categories of contracts. That's nice about dealing with the legal world. Everything is categorized. And so you can uh, potentially support a new style of contract by um, by, by continuing to, to pre-train our model in, in that category. I'm not sure if that answered the question. Yep, thank you. Yeah, my question is, what did you use your annotation data set? And, uh, you know, what kind of format does the annotation have to be? Because I'm wondering, like, how many examples would it take as well to support a new type of contract? Like, I, this has been something I've been very interested in, for example, for term sheets. And could you train us on the data set to help people understand the content of term sheets they're receiving? Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. So I guess the distinction here is there's certain tasks that are extractive in nature and others like ours, which we're like highlighting spans of text. Um, now, uh, to answer your question, essentially what it takes is having a bunch of legal professionals, like lawyers, law students, and so on, annotate contracts manually. Uh, and that way we have a benchmark for what the right answer is. If you take the analog of SAT reading comprehension style questions, uh, there are questions and answers that are highlighted in the passage within the passage. So it's a very similar task. And um, yeah, so the data set we used is similar in, in that sense. Yeah, it, it contains about like 500 contracts and 13,000 annotations. And it was just like recently released at the end of last year. And if you think about that in terms of like lawyer human labor, it comes to about $2 million dollars. In terms of like the work that was spent on the data set. And are the annotations mostly labeling the different blocks? Or yeah. It, yeah, it just spans it's of text. Like, spans of text like. This is awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. To the ego, ego. And now we have the last group before the mid break, which is going to be a 10 minute break. Um, so this group is going to present research auto suggest. Perfect. All right. So hello, everybody. Our project is called Research Auto Suggest. And to introduce myself, and um, my name is Avi, and I'm a current junior studying computer science. And I'm William. Uh, I'm also a junior studying CS and mathematics. 
So the idea of a project is based around the problem of trying to navigate the vast amount of information that's available on the internet and trying to find quotes from articles that can best support a given uh, input claim or input thesis. And currently, to our knowledge, there doesn't exist an automatic quote generation um, sort of system out there that does this. So we decided to create such a system using a ML system that can efficiently take advantage of this inundation of information that's available. With this auto-suggest team that we have, we want to be able to quickly and automatically surface the most relevant content with respect to this user's input thesis. Our key objectives are not only to be fast and serve these results in no time, but to also have high quality results. This means that they are relevant, informative, and also we can note their reliability. So say the user wants to find a source that contains evidence supporting the thesis statement. Research is hard to find. I mean, research is hard with a lot of available information. Our system would take in this query, it would scan the web, and for example, could find a website like this, provide a quote from that website that's most relevant to the input thesis, and also a summary, which is not shown here. So to demonstrate the architecture of our system, we'll go through the life cycle of one input query. So <coughs> our system is hosted on the Google Compute Engine. And once a user inputs their research thesis, it will go to our backend Django server. From there, the user has the option to hit our query cache in order to see if there's previous results that have been similar to their input query that we can surface those preloaded results for that we store. Then for new results, we will go to Google and use a web search interface in order to grab internet content. We'll also look at a credibility database to look at the trustworthiness of the URLs that we scrape. With the scraped data, we pass it through two different types of hugging face pre-trained models. First, a sentence similarity model that will be able to look at the contents of these articles and find what the top and most relevant quotes are. And then with these quotes, we take their context and pass it through a summarization model. This allows us to pretty much surface to the user the context surrounding those top quotes. We tested across a lot of different models, four sentence similarity models and three summarization models on metrics tuned for performance and also latency, and chose to run these specific models shown here on a locally a NVIDIA V100 GPU to get the fastest latency. So in order to evaluate our end-to-end -end system, we did a user study in which we asked our respondents to sort of talk about how they would think they would fare on a task such as searching the internet, reading through three articles, and finding three quotes that are most relevant to the input thesis. And on average, the respondents said that it would take around 750 seconds to perform such a task, which comes out to around 12 minutes, compared to our system, which performs the same exact task in less than five seconds. And this corresponds to a 150 time speed up. We also asked respondents to rate the quality of the results in terms of their relevancy, informativeness, and the quality of the summary of the context that we provided. And as you can see, the results are quite good. All right, and then now we'll transition into our demo. So we decided to host our service on a website. And as Will will show here, we can input an example query, such as what if we want to find evidence for the claim, having pets is good for your health. So we can click submit and let's see. Oops, I think the VM disconnected. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> yeah, just in a couple of seconds. All right, yeah, so now that we're connected to our VM, we'll start back up our server and then connect back to it in our local browser. While you're doing this, can you uh, tell us if you can use the same yeah. thing for finding contradictions, not just uh, similarity? Yeah, sorry, finding like contradictions. contradictions? Yes, or ah, like opposing evidence, yes. Yeah, so generally the models that we use to find the relevant quotes are based on like semantic similarity. So 
based on like if the topic or kind of like the subject of interest is the same, we can like surface results that are kind of supportive or non-supportive of your claim. Things like pets are good for your health. Like we might not find a lot of um, opposing evidence for that, but generally on other more controversial claims, we've definitely seen that we find a, device, a diversity of opinions. And within a matter of seconds, once uh, Will had inputted this query, we got our results, not only the links to the websites, but also quotes and summaries. Do you wanna? Yeah, so for example, one of the websites that we found was cdc.gov. And the summary of the evidence was most households in the United States have at least one pet. Studies have shown that the bond between people and their pets is linked to several health benefits. Pets can help manage loneliness and depression by giving us companionship. So not only did we get relevant information, but we also surfaced some new information and gave that in quote and summary form to the user. Now to highlight another aspect of our system, we have the trustworthiness filter. So we have a finite credibility data set that has a list of URLs and ranks them kind of in terms of being high trustworthiness or having a lot of bias and low trustworthiness. So if we input this claim related to the need for more renewable energy, we see that when we look at the results, these bottom two results here highlighted in green are the most um, trustworthy as designated by our database. If we instead find a result that is not as trustworthy by the database, then we highlight in yellow just to note to the user that maybe this resource needs a little bit more caution when looking at. And then one final query that we'll run is related to our first query quite closely. We instead will say owning pets can improve your mental well-being. Now, if we want to speed up our search even faster, we can look at cached responses. And when we do so, we again use our sentence similarity model to find the closest previous query above a certain confidence threshold. And then we serve these results back extremely quickly with links to the same quotes, summaries, and articles that we had previously found. So yeah, that's a kind of brief whirlwind of our research auto-suggest system. And thank you so much. Um, I, have a, I have a question, two, two, yeah. two phrases I'm curious about. One is like, what if you put in more quantitative questions, like say, you know, market size for, uh, you know, pet collars or something like that? Like, does it, uh, you know, what would, and then the second question I have is, what about something potentially biased? If you put in like, Trump is a terrible president, yeah. you know, w would it reinforce that or does it go to more objective sources? Yeah, so for the, to answer your first question, I think um, we, we had an idea to extend our search query and like parse it, extract out important information, and then use it to, I guess, search a more um, specific result. Um, that's something we haven't gotten to yet, but it was definitely something we were considering extending to. And to answer your second question, um, I agree there's a lot of sources out there that can provide biased information. Maybe it, depending on what you search, you could sort of like reinforce your already existing, pre-existing notions, sort of like an echo chamber. But I think for in terms of our project, I don't think, I think we decided that it wasn't really our prerogative to decide like what you should be able to see and what you shouldn't be able to see. Um, as long as we provide like a warning that, you know, hey, this source generally is not known for being the most reliable, citing the most credible sources. We thought that was sufficient rather than, you know, censoring sources or, you know, Stuff like that. Yeah, and some of our results, maybe not from like queries like pets are great for your health, but maybe looking at like other examples of queries, climate change is bad, have surfaced also like some numerical results that are captured in our quotes and summaries as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to all the groups who presented in the first half of our demo day. Now we're going to have a 10 minute break and we will be resuming at 525. See you guys in 10 minutes. Feel free to grab drinks and uh, food outside yeah, and yeah, hang out. With the, uh, yeah. Liberal yeah. conservative folks. Put like a deck together. Yeah. 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 yeah, a lot, a lot of people. <laughs> Can you guys see my screen? Okay, I think uh, Alex, you can go ahead and start it. Perfect, thank you. Uh, hi everyone, thanks for your time today. Uh, I'm here to present Synance, uh, which is a project by William Hu and Chu Han Feng, both SCPD students and myself uh, doing masters in bioengineering. Next slide, Sorry. next one. 
So why Synance? The idea behind the project is that uh, cryptocurrencies do not have an underlying valuation methodology that the market has agreed on. So there is a lot of uncertainty in how these assets are valued. Next slide. Given that there is no underlying um, single model for valuation, uh, there is multiple factors that uh, influence the price of uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, some of these markets are the movement of the stock market in general and the macro, uh, macro environment. Um, other factors, including price of other uh, cryptocurrencies and uh, other factors also include news sentiment, Reddit sentiment, Twitter sentiment, and perhaps uh, Elon Musk's tweet. Uh, next slide. So here's our design overview. Uh, we have two machine learning systems. One is for price prediction, one is for sentiment analysis. Using the results from those two systems, our users should get, um, get a clear idea of the market situation and can make their trading decisions accordingly. Um, so for the price prediction, uh, we are trying to predict the future price of, uh, of a cryptocurrency given its uh, historical data. Uh, we have two models here. The first one is called ARIMA, uh, which stands for Autoregressive Integrated Moving Average. It's a widely used um, model or one of the most widely used model in quantum trading fields. And it's very simple, but very powerful. The second one is called PROFIT. Um, it's pop first published by Facebook in 2017. Uh, it's a nonlinear regression model that contains three major components, which allows it to accommodate the seasonality, the trend, and the holidays in end time series. Compared with ARIMA, it's easier to interpret, faster to train, and more flexible to work with. Both of them are um, time series models. Um, so uh, let's talk about our data engineering. The raw input to our data is going to be the price trend of a cryptocurrency. As you can see on the left, it's non-stationary, and it's uh, hard for the model to predict. So in order to solve that problem, we convert it into log return. The log return is simply the, um, it's stationary and it's easy to obtain. And plus it has very good numerical stability and we can calculate the price um, easily by using, uh, by using the equation over here. Next, Truhan is going to talk about the, um, the sentiment analysis part. So uh, we already talked so much about the price prediction, but can we only rely on the price data to predict the future of market trend? The answer is no, because crypto <coughs> are strongly tied to real world events. So in order to solve this, uh, the market sentiment is a good way to evaluate the market, uh, the future, the future market trend. So we, what we can do is to leverage news and media to evaluate the market sentiment. And here is our complete pipeline for evaluate the market sentiment. Uh, uh, first, in the first stage. Uh, for a given cryptocurrency, we are going to fetch some relevant news. With this re relevant news, we can put them into the summarization model to generate some summarization of the news. And the summarization will be fed into the financial sentiment analysis model uh, to obtain the sentiment score for each of the three classes. And uh, we can also fed, we can also feed the, the news into the keyword extraction model and the extracted keyword will be used to generate the word cloud uh, in, our, in our product. And uh, next slide. And here is our system architecture. So in the middle is our application. Uh, it's hosted on Streamlit Cloud. And the people, uh, uh, I mean, user will directly interact with uh, this Streamlit application. And the application will fetch the data from uh, Crypto News API and Coin API.io. Uh, those, those are our uh, real time data source. And uh, in order to process, process a large amount of data uh, in a short period of time, we leverage uh, Google Cloud Data Proc. Uh, we run a Spark cluster on Google Cloud Data, data Proc. And uh, the application will communicate with the uh, Spark clusters through uh, Google Cloud Storage. And uh, the Firestore are used to, uh, are, are used in our app application as a cache layer. So our result will be cached in the, uh, in the Firestore. Uh, and uh, that's for the system architecture. And uh, now I'll give a quick demo for our product. So 
so uh yeah so here is the link to our demo is hosted on the streamlit cloud so it's a public link uh after i click this yeah you will see interface uh, which have some uh, uh, interactive widgets on the left. Uh, those are some parameters user can tune to interact with uh, this app. And we can see uh, here are some uh, very important uh, indicators such as the price, uh, uh, the like the forecasted gain. And this one is predicted by the profit model as is specified on the left here. And uh, we also have the Bollinger Band uh, and uh, the Bollinger Band position, which is a very important indicator. And we can uh, change it to uh, something like a uh, Bitcoin and it will show the Bitcoin, Bitcoin uh, price in that. And also the Bollinger Band and the future predictions for the Bitcoin, part, uh, Bitcoin price. And uh, we also have the Arima model here. If I switch to Arima, you can see uh, this result is not as, as, as good as profit. And so the, like the default is the profit. Uh, here is the price prediction and the statistical analysis part. Analysis part. And we also have the sentiment analysis uh, here. You can see there are a list of new source we can choose from. Uh, for In this case, I'll just select all of them. So we'll gather all the uh, news from this new source and uh, the application will just run after I select this. Uh, so sometimes it, it not takes a while to respond. Yeah. And uh, it found uh, more than 2000 of record in the last month. And uh, this application will then send the request to the backend Spark cluster to process all the data. The reason why the Spark cluster is to um, speed up the processing, like the processing speed, and it usually takes, uh, like for for this Bitcoin, it takes like a seven or eight minutes. But um, for uh, Solana, it, it takes like one and one and a half minutes. I won't wait for this. Instead, I will show uh, another instance. We have already run before. And so please wrap up if you can. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so here is the, the sentiment analysis result. And the green bar is uh, the positive element. The red bar is negative. And you can also see there is a word cloud generated in the end, uh, which gives us a better insight of the, the market trend. And uh, I think that's it for the demo. Any questions? Yeah, so I think, um, should we? Okay, thank you to our market prediction group. And now we have the next group in person. Um, sorry, we try to schedule everything so that we would have the remote groups together, but it didn't exactly work out that way. So the next group is going to be Fash, Fash Flicks. And uh, just a quick reminder, when you're holding your microphones, please try to hold it like close to your mouth. Yeah, thanks. Hi, I'm Kevin from Mona, and I'm Anthony, and we're Fast Flights. So let's consider this. Our friend Frank over here is really sad as he owns some outdated clothes. He decides it's time to spice his wardrobe up a bit, and he's inspired by this Mr. Good Looking dude over here. <laughs> Fortunately for him, he encounters Fast Flicks, which is our fashion recommender. Amazed and wowed by the recommended, recommended products, 
He decides to purchase a checkered shirt, just like Mr. Goodlooking, and now he's a good old happy friend. <laughs> so what is fast clicks? Well, it might help to describe what the competitors or standard fashion shopping today is. It's very bottleneck and convolved about where the products that you want are. They could be on page seven halfway down. You don't know where the products you want are. But fast clicks, on the other hand, is quick access to products curated from multiple catalogs relevant recommendations based on fits you loved, and a better personalized wardrobe in just a few swipes. This slide, okay. this slide illustrates our full architecture and how we go from an image to fashion embeddings and finally to generating a product, real life product recommendations. To get to where we are today, we've done a couple, several rounds of iterations. We started out with a fine tuned ResNet as an encoder to generate our fashion embeddings. We later explored segmentation using units to generate even better recommended uh, embeddings. We also increased the attribute count from 30 to 36. We then implemented a class balance loss based on the effective number of samples. For our product catalog, we started out with stock images from the deep fashion dataset. We then scraped various clothing stores such as Gap, Zappos, Express using tools like Selenium. We used Spark to handle scaling. We, we improved our user flow by adding an additional step that allows you to refine your user preferences. And lastly, we all, due to limitations from uh, Streamlit, we moved away from it into a React Django uh, stack. All the above will become more clear during our live day. All right. Welcome to Fastflix. This is the landing page. Um, the front end is just uh, establishing connection with the back end, the Django back end right now. So when you log into Fastflix, there's only one question you need to answer, which is the type of clothing that you're looking for right now. So I'm going to click Men's. And there's three primary interactions that you can undertake on the website. You can explore the product catalog, which has curated products from across a bunch of online catalogs. You can personalize the recommendations you're shown. And if you have an outfit in mind, you can search for similar outfits based on image appeal. So let's go through these. Um, right now, you're a new user in the app. Fastflix doesn't know what you like uh, or what you dislike. So it's going to um, get random recommendations from a product catalog. But you can personalize these recommendations using a Tinder-like swipe feature. Um, when you swipe um, on, uh, so I, I don't like the shirt, so I'm going to swipe left on it. I like these blue pants, so I'm going to swipe right. And by telling Fastflix what you like or dislike, you allow Fastflix's recommender to optimize the uh, recommendation based on your preference. But today I'm on the app for a specific uh, reason. I am looking for an outfit that's similar to what Chris is wearing here. Um, so I'm gonna give it, uh, give Fastflix this one image and wait for it to recommend some amazing products um, based on attributes such as the weather for which the clothing is appropriate, um, whether the shirt has sleeves, buttons, zippers, et cetera. And we see that the recommendations do um, uh, uh, have parallels with the query image that we had. Um, we have t-shirts, as well as these black pants that are similar to the comfort pants that Chris is wearing. And I think I really like these pants. So I'm going to forget about the shirts, and I'm actually going to uh, go in for a pair of pants today. So I can rate these recommendations. I'm going to swipe left on all of the t-shirts and swipe right on the um, pants that I like. And hopefully, uh, based on these swipes, flashlicks, flashlicks can learn that I'm looking to buy pants today. Um, so I'm going to swipe right on that, and by this point, there's enough data for Fastflix to understand uh, what I'm looking for, and we can go back to the product catalog. So based on my swipes, my user preference vector has been uh, updated, and lo and behold, my product catalog feed has changed. It's now full of pens, um, which is amazing. That, um, Fastflix was able to discern from the user uh, interactions on the website. The, um, it was able to draw insights about my preferences. It was able to identify that I'm trying to buy pants. And there's a lot of diversity here with a couple of shorts thrown in. Um, so I'm, I'm just gonna look for uh, a decent price range and a uh, good waiting. Sorry, <laughs> too hot. I'm good. And um, I see some pants that I can buy from uh, the online catalog that it was uh, straight from. That's our demo for today, and we're happy to see the questions.
so much a question. How do you disentangle or, uh, you know, uh, break down the input images? Do you have like um, segmentation uh, model that you actually know how many items in a single image? Um, not the number of items in a single image, but uh, speaking of segmentation, we do have data on, you know, uh, we, have, we have attempt uh, to train the model to recognize background versus foreground, so, or the person versus background, uh, because we have that data in a data set, uh, which is what we did when we moved towards the unit. Uh, yeah, I like the swiping feature for figuring out what my personal preferences are. But I think once you get the segmentation, you can quickly say, like, I just want pants, you know, take out the swiping for those kinds of things. Um, just so that that's like a very black and white thing. Right. But the I mean, preferences are, is awesome. Yeah, right. And, and to, you know, we do have the, the, data, the segmentation data per piece. Mm -hmm. It's definitely like an avenue worth exploring. Well, uh, taking user input to say, mm -hmm. I just want pants. Now, model learns to you know identify pants when the image is only returns pants more explicitly than how we've done it right. in a more implicit way. Right? Yep. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much to Fast Flicks. And now the next group is going to be presenting over Zoom once again. Um, so the next group, emoji prediction whenever you're ready. Yep. Uh, can you guys see the slides? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so hello, everyone. Uh, this is another emoji prediction project. My name is Chen Xuan, um, and I will be presenting our final project for the course. Um, so we're trying to provide an online uh, inference service for emoji prediction with model distillation. Um, this is our team, uh, uh, Eric, uh, Chen Ye, and me. Uh, Eric and Chen Ye, do you guys want to say hi? I saw you guys online as well. Hi, right. we're here. Yeah. Hi, Charlie. Great. Um, so this will be the outline of today's talk. Um, I will go over our goals, our design, our demo, our system, followed by a post evaluation. Um, now let us first talk about why we choose this project. So imagine uh, you are typing out a search query on Google.com. Google will show you query suggestions. As a customer, we are probably not going to wait if there is a few second delay. So here it's actually a concrete research study about user attrition rate or user dropout rate versus latency. It shows that if the system introduces more than 1,000 millisecond delay or one second delay, it is almost certain that the user are going to feel about it. And hence, the study also shows that larger latency is, the more likely the users are going to drop out from the sessions. So this heavily affects the applicability of large uh, machine learning models as we talk about in the class for model distillation. Pre-trained language model, for instance, although really powerful and many NLP tasks are often too large to fit into any service that requires low latency or edge devices. So here it comes to our goal, which is to seek a way to build an online inference system that can leverage good performance provided by large language models and also ensures a low latency. With this bigger picture in mind, uh, we land our project um, on a specific use case, which is to, um, sorry, which is to um, build a fast yet effective emoji prediction service for tweets with model distillation. We have four key technical objectives. Um, first, low latency. Second, uh, we want to um, aim for a good task performance for emoji prediction. And then we also want to ensure a good user experience by providing a diverse of emoji predictions. Last but not least, we also want to distill our uh, smaller model with less training data. So we build our emoji prediction system end to end. Um, on the left hand side, we lay, lay out our user workflow. Um, uh, so as you can see, the client uh, talks to uh, our service through the UI, and then UI will send requests to our backend inference service, which then it will route it to a send to emoji module, which I will talk about later, which uh, send back the emoji to the client. So behind the scene, there are two major components, the online model inference service and the offline model distillation components. So we build all of those two components um, from scratch. So for our online model inference service, uh, we host our UI on the Heroku server, uh, which talks to the backend, runs as a Python Flask macro service. Um, it will load our model and it will do the inference. We um, host our backend uh, server specifically um, in pur on purpose uh, on this very small CPU only VM machine on Microsoft Azure. 
For our model distillation method, we extend one, to, one of the most advanced uh, model distillation method for language models to our inference task, which is emoji prediction. So specifically, we fine tune our larger teacher model with the data sets, um, and then we distill a smaller student model by, by aligning the causal behavior of the student model and the teacher model. One thing to note here is that our task here is to do a multi-label sentiment inference. Um, so uh, after we get the sentiment label of the input tweets, we then uh, we we actually then uh, pass the sentiment label into another very lightweight multi-layer perceptron to convert the emotion labels to emojis. So to put sorry the I think it's lagging a little bit. Um, so to put everything together, our model inference service loads a distilled model and predicts emotion tags. Then our send to emoji module to returns the emoji to the user. With that, um, I will go ahead with the demo. Um, so this is our um, uh, Twitter-like uh, uh, front end, uh, which is host on the Heroku server. Um, and uh, you can type uh, a tweet. Uh, let's try. Let me see my face. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so this will uh, talk to our backend and it will render an emoji for you. So let's try a counter example or set maybe. Um, so it will render another emoji uh, for you. Uh, maybe I'll try last one. Which is tailored to our project. Um, so, okay, it shows another uh, emoji for you. Um, so um, last but not least, I also want to go over um, some uh, one last slide about uh, the post uh, evaluations side of the whole pipeline. Um, so um, the, we, we plot the latency of our system compared to a normal uh, bird-based model on the left-hand side, uh, as you can see. So we have lowered the latency by more than 20%. On the right-hand side, we also show the performance of our model compared to other model dissolution methods in a low resource setting, uh, where we only have 1,000 training examples for the uh, distillation uh, part. So our method also beats other uh, state of art in performance as well. Um, so here it comes to the uh, end of today's uh, talk. Um, so in the summary, uh, we build, sorry, we build a fast, uh, Sorry, the, okay, it comes. Uh, so in summary, we build a fast inference uh, model uh, service for emoji prediction while maintaining a good performance. Additionally, we also innovate a model distribution method with very limited training data. So we hope this demo is working towards our overarching goal, which is to provide a service with good user experience powered by a large ML method while keeping uh, latency low. Uh, thank you. Since there are no questions, we will be welcoming the next group who will be presenting a, a real-time book illustrator. Can you hear me? Can you? Great, perfect. So, hey, um, I'm, I'm Alban, um, this is Gary, and this is Rubens. Um, so, um, we did a little shift since this book illustrator, because today we're going <laughs> to uh, present you like a custom um, gaming avatar system, which we, which we call uh, Insta Avatar. Um, so basically, this is a quite common situation you can face every day, like when you create an account somewhere uh, on, an, on, an, on an online system and you have to provide a, a photo of you and you don't, want, uh, you don't want to give a picture of you and you get this very random avatar. So I don't know, maybe you recognize them. So does someone recognize one of those, av those avatars? No. So, yeah. So this is the um, messenger avatar, the Facebook messenger, and this one is the very famous one from the Wii, if some players played the Wii when they were children, as I, as I was playing when I was a child. Um, anyway, and so like we wanted to provide like a quick and reality free and, and original avatar photos for everyone when you create an account, basically, and we like uh, recycle our idea of Book Illustrator. I can I can hide this. <laughs> All right, so. Perfect. 
Yeah, so for this test, we chose to use these uh, text to images models, and there are quite a few of them. We can we found some on Hugging Face as well, and these are some examples of uh, the the images that were generated from the. So basically, they can generate images from scratch using a a user input like a caption. So for example, with the Dolly model, the caption was an armchair in the shape of an avocado, and you can see it generates pretty much that. And then the Pixray model generates what it like what the caption says, more or less. Mm -hmm. And then the, the third one is it's a painting of an artificial intelligence killing humanity, and it's it seems more or less accurate. All right. So we think there are three main benefits of having you know automatically generated avatars. The first is because it's so fast and cheap, users can typically can just generate any avatar they want for any new site or game they visit. And um, they can even replace uh, AI uh, uh, characters with their own avatars. Like if, if we are in a zoo, you can say, I want this, all these to be my chickens and all these to be my, my ducks. And uh, we have sort of like a personalized uh, gaming experience. Uh, the second thing is we can potentially theme our images. So for example, if a content provider platform says that, hey, uh, this is a child's game, we want other avatars to be cartoons. Or if um, you, know, you want to express your artistic uh, side of of yourself to have a sketch, you can do that as well. And by the way, all these are actual generated images from our model. And the third uh, benefit is because each user in our platform has a unique ID, these IDs will be the seed from which the model will generate these uh, images from. So this, this means that these images will always be unique to the user and the user can bring it across uh, multiple platforms uh, and it will still be the same Im image. Right, so um, quick look through into our system. So it looks like it's a bit hidden in the right hand side. Never mind. So basically, it's quite um, straightforward. So um, we had like this inference pipeline where we have like a CPU receiving like the um, um, the user input, etc. And um, this is all um, the back end is all um, dealt with radio, and the front end with Streamlit. Um, then we have like a GPU like that deals with like the model predictions with the user's input of the caption, and uh, the latency is a real key in that. This was like our main hurdle um, with the MVP. It took like about two minutes to generate images, so we struggle a lot to make predictions really fast because we don't want to lose users because of that. And then what we did also, as, as Gary presented, um, we tried like to change the predictions model so that they can. Um, adopt a specific style, like a cartoon style images, like uh, um, painting uh, style imaging, etc. And so uh, this is what we try to do using like um, a publicly available um, caption in, in photos data sets. And so now let's go for the demo. So it's going to be um, wall first um, in, uh, it's going to be an interactive demo. So um, hoping that you have good ideas to propose because we're going to generate your personal own um, uh, avatars. So is someone volunteer? <laughs> yeah. So what um, what do you want um, has to what do you want what, what what do you want your avatar to look like, Kinbert? Like a, of a, cat. <laughs> a cat. A cat. A cat. A cat is a great idea. <laughs> Just a cat first. <laughs> that was. Um, very good. So yeah. So Kinbert, you're running great. <laughs> <laughs> Looks nice. So uh, we can train something more fancy, yeah? Like a cat that can kill you, you with a sleep. <laughs> oh, <laughs> killer cat. <laughs> killer cat. <laughs> Very dark. All right, so yeah, as I told, um, like um, inference time, like latency is a bit hurdle, so we tried to make, <laughs> yeah, look at him. You can see, you can see fear in the eyes, probably is going to kill us in, in a few minutes, so it's it's quite accurate for this one. <laughs> just, just say that, hey, Avatar has already been generated. Um, so, so yeah, so we have other training parameters here that you can tune. For example, you can uh, change the hyperparameters, or you can enable or, or disable upsampling. So this allows the admin to, you know, improve or, or, or change the image um, as, as, as we as we go. All right. Um, yeah. So 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 basically, every user would have um, a, a unique account. So for example, you can see um, maybe you can. So so like my account would have my pre-generated 
uh, avatars that I can you know use for um, my applications as I go to different websites and different platforms. Ruben, do you want to know? Do you have questions, guys, or anything to to discuss? Actually, yeah. Uh, how how much more do you think you can improve the latency? Uh, do you think we can get to the point where kind of just talking and can generate things on the fly? Yeah. So as as I said at the very beginning, like uh, we shifted our project. We wanted like a book illustrator. Mm. So basically, you would like read, read. like real time text and give like cartoons for like children or something. Mm -hmm. uh, and like. Uh, all the pretreatment models that are available online right now, uh, they're really, really slow. Yeah. Like this was like the, the quickest we could do, honestly. Mm -hmm. So maybe with like what was done in the previous project with like a knowledge distillation, this could be, I think, a solution to uh, improve the latency. But definitely yeah, this is like the key business hurdle, like the, like, the latency. So right now is is maybe like, we also have only a K80 GPU. So mm -hmm. maybe if we increase increase the, um, the GPU that we're, we're using, but yeah, latency is really like the key metrics uh, for uh, our our system. Very nice. Yeah, I think it could be really cool as an API, so like anyone who build a website can just access it and use yeah, it. Yes. Yeah. That, yeah. That is, so this will be like yeah. 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 The the URL is just over here. So if you want to play um, and create your account in. Not right now because we're gonna you're gonna DDoS us, but <laughs> but in five minutes you will be able to play if you want at home or or in the room. Yeah, this is awesome. Thank yeah, you. Nice. Avatar. I hope you guys can all use that to generate your new gaming avatars. That's very exciting. And now let's welcome the next group: Image to Insulin Estimator. All right, I would like all of you to look at this image here and think to yourselves, how many carbohydrates do you think that there are in this meal? <laughs> it's a very difficult um, problem, and it's a problem that people with diabetes type 1 and certain people with diabetes type 2 face every single day. Because for every meal that they eat, they need to estimate, estimate the amount of carbs in a given meal in order to know how much insulin to inject for that meal. And given that uh, type 1 diabetes alone affects 20 million people worldwide. This is a problem that would be super nice to improve upon. So my name is Abdul Moskul, and together with my team members, Mohamed Salman and Ling Xin Yao, we have tried to build a tool to help with this problem. So our goal is that we want to take in an image of a food, and then we want to try to estimate the insulin dosage from that image using machine learning. Uh, the insulin yeah, needed, which we will then, we need to calculate the amount of carbs for that. So uh, let me jump right into a demo. So whenever a user interacts with our application, the first step will be to upload an image of the food that they are eating. So in this case, I'll show you the exact same image that I showed you before. And what then happens right away is that our model then predicts which foods it finds in this image. And in this case, it has found miso soup down here green salad here, and a beef bowl here. So then the next step for the user will be to input their insulin factor, which is a factor for how many carbs, or yeah, how much insulin they need for a given amount of carbs. And this is something that they will calculate together with their doctor. And then they'll need to input which of, oh, let's see what happened there, um, which of the foods were uh, predicted correctly over here. Um, and after that, they need to input the weight of these foods. And this is obviously like a drawback of our application that you need to estimate the food still, but it could be done if you're at home with a scale or using some heuristic, um, like measuring in your hand or something. So in this case, I think that the miso soup is about 40 grams, the beef bowl about 300, and uh, the green salad about 50 grams. So if I now press submit, you will see... Oh, this is because this one disappeared when we, um, let's see now. 
Yeah, so now our system finds that the recommended insulin that should be injected based on this meal is 3.5 units of insulin. So this is our main application, but I also wanted to show you an online monitoring dashboard that we have built to, um, to constantly monitor our progress with this application. So as we will see on our um, dashboard, we have two different views. One that is for more for business and one that is more for developers as soon as this has loaded. All right. So here we are on the business view of our online monitoring dashboard. So we can instantly see um, a quick update of how we have done on the last 10 samples and also some time series of our progress over time. If we instead switch to the developer's view, we get a more we will get the more in-depth information about how the different models, we, we train different model sizes for this, how they have performed over the last samples, uh, as you can see here. And then we also get just the, the last samples that were uploaded um, to, to the program, which were the ones that I just uploaded now during the demo. So now that we know what, what my group has built and um, also the monitoring dashboard, I would like to dive further into uh, the technicalities of how it works. So as I showed you before, the flow of information that happens is that users upload an image of food to our user device, um, which is then passed to our deployed model in cloud. And we have both trained and deployed our model in, in Google using Google Cloud services. And the model that of our choosing is a YOLO v5 object detection model that we trained for nano, small, and medium sizes so that we could find a sweet spot between um, latency and performance. And in this demo, I chose the nano version because I wanted to be quick here. Um, yeah, and then the next step that we go through in our application is that we pass, we search for these identified food items in a nutrition database. And we get this information from the USDA nutrition database. However, querying this remote database takes a lot of time and has latency that we don't want. So we have actually just made a local file with all of the information that we will actually need based on the labels that we know that we have in our data set. Finally, as you could see before, the users need to input the food item weights and then gets the insulin dosage. And at the same time, every interaction that happened here is passed to a database that we have in MongoDB Atlas that can be accessed from anywhere so that all the stakeholders of the project can have a, a monitoring dashboard to see how, how the application is doing. Yeah, so that is how me and my team have uh, gone about help, trying to help the day-to-day -day life of people with diabetes. Thank you for listening. This is a really meaningful project. So what was the most surprising to you when you were working on this uh, application? Most surprising? Yeah. Um, I don't know. One thing that was a bit surprising, or like one thing that we really wanted to do was to also, you know, estimate the weights of, of, of uh, all of the food items. Um, and, and I kind of had a hope that we would be able to do that with, you know, just mathematical tools, like using if we take two photos and then we can calculate depth. But that turned out to be super difficult, which we found out after talking to some Stanford people who are experts on those kind of things. Um, yeah, so that's one thing. Is there any research on trying to identify the weight by any chance? Uh, yeah, so we, we have looked at other approaches. Okay. And um, like, so you could try to do it mathematically, but it's a difficult task. So, this needs yeah. to be quite precise. Okay. But of course, like if we were to build a data set for this, like it, it doesn't strike me as a very complicated computer vision task if we would have had labels. Yeah, yeah. So I think, and and actually, as we were halfway through this project, we then there was published another report that mm. was more on that line of building a data set and using that. Mm -hmm. So I think that is really like the future of how this could be taken forward. Gotcha. And uh, just one more follow up. Um, so uh, actually, maybe I might ask you. I, I've noticed you got the, you have a monitor on you. Yeah. Uh, is, was that used as part of the project to get uh, the readings through that? No, or? no, no. It okay. was not. Uh, okay. But but it really opens up exciting possibilities. If, yeah. If we would have data, you know, of of all meals that were eaten. Yeah. I think that could really improve the algorithms that exist, you know, in in the devices that are today. Yeah. Which is also really exciting. Does that the the factor that you included does that account for different people's like baselines and their reaction to certain foods? 
or is that, is that factor the like the point one that you had there, yeah. or does that not encompass different uh, reactions and different spike behaviors? Yes. So th that's kind of a good thing that like you only kind of need to know that that factor is the same. Uh, basically, to know how much insulin you need to inject, you just need to know how many carbs are there mm -hmm. and what are your factors. Your fact, okay. And like you can be fancy if it's like very slow carbs or very mm -hmm. fast carbs, but generally, like you always use the same, which makes gotcha. the problem a lot easier. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. I was just curious. Um, what, you know, did you get feedback from diabetics and, and what do they think of the UX and the product? Yeah. So I have it myself, <laughs> but yeah. we have not uh, queried any other people. Uh, and I would say like. Right now, it's it's uh, like, and you know, I've had it for quite a long time, so I can kind of make that estimation myself. So I think it will be most useful. First, it needs to become a bit better, but then it will be most useful for people who just got it, because you know, it's super difficult. Then you're always looking up in tables trying to find these percentages that we get like that. So I think, yeah, if we would improve it a bit, and then provide it to new people, yeah. But we have not asked them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now our next group, Goopify. Okay, great. So how many of you people love listening to music? Nice. We do too. <laughs> and as anyone who likes listening to music, you know how important playlists are to you. So we take a lot of effort into creating um, playlists for ourselves with songs that we really love. Yeah. But uh, so currently the USP of uh, like uh, systems like Spotify and Apple Music is that they have this discover feature, which generates a playlist for you based on your past listening history. But nothing like this exists for groups of people. Uh, and we thought that was really odd because music is such a powerful tool for bringing people together. So we wanted to uh, create. Uh, so the closest competitor this, to a group genera playlist generation system is Spotify blend, but that only takes into account the listening history of two people. And it only takes into account the top tracks of each person and just adds it in. It doesn't uh, do any computation to ensure that uh, the uh, the playlist has tracks that the other person will like. It'll only take your tracks and then the other person's tracks, but doesn't take into account like the homogeneity of how much each person will like the track. So that really motivated us to create this uh, recommendation system that we're going to talk to you about. Cool. Um, so before one time. OK, cool. So before we, I guess, uh, get into the technical details, let's go through our demo real quick. OK, so the landing page looks like this. It'll prompt you to log in with Spotify. Um, as soon as you do, you can create your own party. So uh, like Tara mentioned, this is for multiple users. Therefore, we have to have multiple user interactions available. Um, I'm going to send him. So she can send me the party, party code. code. Mm -hmm. And okay. I can join the party. Cool. Um, and now we're going to create our merged playlist. So this can take some time. So while this is working, um, our, our metric is that a human play, a human generated playlist with 50 songs will take about half an hour and ours takes under a minute. So we're, we're doing OK. Um, OK. Let me. So the problems, um, the main problem is what does the user music profile look like? Um, what data would it consist of and how much data is enough data? And then again, because we're dealing with multiple users, um, what matters in playlists for multiple users? Are we looking for similar genres, um, you know, similar sounds or just arbitrary songs? So our solutions, when it comes to data and how we you know, generated our user profile, we specifically looked at public playlists. And this is specifically uh, for, you know, because generally when you have a public playlist, it accurately represents the user. These are songs that the user is okay with, representing them publicly. And it's also easy for, you know, new Spotify users to 
create a profile without actually having listening history. We also used um, the 25 most recently listened to songs just to represent the user's current mood. Actually, I think this is done, if I can find my mouse. OK, yeah, cool. So this is what like our merged playlist looks like between the entire it's a mix of his rock and hip hop and my R&B and pop. OK, we can go back. So the way we create a user profile is with the tracks the user has, like Santina just mentioned, public playlists and top listen two tracks. Uh, each track is full of rich uh, features. Mm -hmm. And uh, so these are a combination of uh, mood, which uh, we have like a danceability feature, energy, tempo, balance, instrumentalness, uh, which we get from the Spotify API. In addition, we can also get the key and mode of the overall track. Fractions of audio segments in each of the 12 major pitches in classical music. And then we have fractional segments in major and minor mode. We have a timber vector, which is generated, as well as we do signal processing features like zero crossing rate, which is on one end for like YC music and one end for instrumental music. Then we have the spectral cent centroid and spectral roll off, which both speak about the frequency content. Uh, in addition, we have artist and genre information. So this profile pretty much. Uh, encapsulates the information in a musical track. Cool. Um, so when it comes to the actual model, something that we were trying to struggle, like we were struggling a lot with is, you know, how do we, you know, classify this user profile? So we decided to go with unsupervised learning because there really isn't any, you know, label and we're trying to find similarities and overlap between different user profiles. Another thing we were thinking about is, you know, content-based recommendation systems versus collaborative. Again, we chose content-based um, because we're, again, looking for similarities and overlap. So the way we solve this is specifically by using k-means clustering, where we do an initial round of clustering to find the major overlaps between, like, among a combined user profile consisting of all the users within a party. And then we do a subsequent search for a multi-user overlap within each cluster to get more accurate results. So a little bit about our tech stack. We use Python, Flask, React for the front end, and then we deploy it on Heroku. Um, and then we use Redis and like a Python RQ worker for background uh, processes and jobs. So essentially our system looks like this. We have multiple you know, clients uh, as users, which interact with our socket IO server. Um, this interacts with our REST API, which gets information about the tracks from the Spotify API and gets inference results from the Groupify model. Yeah. So, and once you have the created playlist, we have a bunch of ways that we can evaluate how well the playlist is doing. So one is user feedback, and you can get that directly when you like a song on Spotify, we can directly find out if you liked it and you've added it to your playlist. Then, then there's a two, three, and four features, evaluation metrics that we came up with. One was genre newness, then you have song newness and song homogeneity. So genre newness is how many uh, uh, genres in the created playlist are there that are not in your uh, user history. And song newness is the same thing, but with songs. And homogeneity is uh, how the k-means works, because we're taking the songs which are the most similar based on the music, like the different music features which they just spoke about. So our recommendation, uh, like we spoke about, is purely content-based, and the content is based on just the content connected to the user profiles in the Spotify party. Uh, with that itself, we could do pretty well. In future work, if we were to take this forward, we would like to use the rich information of all public user content in Spotify to make it extended to collaborative filtering, including content filtering. And the other thing we uh, saw was the inference also requires a lot of get calls to Spotify API, which is fine, but then it's slow. So prefetching and you know storing it offline could really help with this inference process uh, if we had to like make it uh, a product and also expand to other streaming services. Right now we're using a web app, uh, maybe cast it. You know these are relatively simple extensions. So that's where we uh, that's where we plan to take it if we plan to work on this in the future. Uh, yeah, thank you very much and happy to take any questions. So this is really cool. I want to know more about the feature extraction, especially for music retrieval. And uh, uh, A, did you use any lexical information or experiment with that from like the lyrics? And uh, how did you deal with the key means 
um, with the isotropic limitation, like the cluster shapes, right? If they're not like uh, alike, and uh, especially like any normalization that you have done. Okay, so I can take the question about the features. Yeah. Yeah. The features are not lyrics based. We don't have any uh, non acoustic features here. Everything's based on the, the musical signal and the tone. So these were mostly got, uh, I would say most of the features were got from the Spotify API. Spotify calculates, uh, you know, chord, uh, chords and everything per segment. We also used uh, some Python library to get more spectral features. Um, the k-means clustering, what was your question on that? For the isotropic uh, precondition or the limitation in the cluster shapes, how did you do any like normalization or did you deal with that differently? So we primarily use normalization for most of our features. Um, I guess we did a lot of experimentation trying to figure out like the cluster size and you know what shape I guess works best depending on like the because like the user profiles had like relatively similar, I guess, shapes. Um, and that's kind of how we dealt with it for now. And then I guess regarding your lyrics question, something that we were thinking about was looking at NLP, like an additional NLP model aspect to look at like specifically song titles. Yep. So I figured that would help with the mood too. Um, so that's something that we're looking at for future work. Very cool, thank you. Thank you. Okay, it's almost over. <laughs> we have four more groups and we will be making a small schedule change. So Nick's uh, demo is actually pre-recorded. So we're going to move that to the end. So after this presentation, it will be Camille's group um, who is going to be presenting over Zoom. So Camille, please be ready for that after this group goes. Uh, and now let's give it up for augmented image search. Hello, everyone. Um, we are presenting augmented image search. And I'm in person, and I have two SCPD teammates. Um, I'll let them introduce themselves if they can hear us. Hey, I'm Srikanth. Hey, I'm Shaker. OK, great. So our motivation was if there is a person who is interested in interior decoration, but they're just really lazy. So they have this artistic vision of having multiple different kinds of very specific uh, furniture in their room. But then they don't want to take the time to go to one of the furniture websites like IKEA and then place drag and drop each of those images in place they just want to go to Google, pop in their very specific image search, and then try to see the results that come out of it. So for instance, 18th century coffee table next to a blue armchair. And we can just see this is just Google, but um, within the first few images, like, yes, one such room exists in the entire world. And then it just degrades completely into like blue tables and blue rugs, nothing about like um, armchairs or anything like that in this. So our concern was enable this lazy interior decorator to be able to see their vision um, in complete um, image search generation itself. So our proposed solution is that the person enters their entire query along with some keywords um, into an image search looking um, UI, and then they'll be able to get the relevant results based on the keywords and based on the image uh, in the keywords inside the image query itself. And then we are going back and forth um, between the tools we will describe uh, within this image in more detail um, and trying to figure out uh, whether we need to produce uh, already existing images within our storage cache or if we need to generate a new image. And that image generation is another feature that we worked on and where the core of our like ML is going on besides the text understanding. So Shekhar will describe this part. So uh, hi guys, uh, we prepared the training dataset by first sampling uh, images from Paperfly dataset. Uh, that dataset did not have text descriptions associated with images. So initially we hand annotated them. Uh, then we built a neural image caption uh, generation model to build text descriptions for new set of images as we added them to the, to the dataset. So this neural image caption generation model mm -hmm. uses uh, Inception V3, in which we pass on images and it extracted feature uh, embeddings from uh, image embeddings from them. Uh, as for the text uh, 
descriptions associated associated with those images uh, like each of those text encodings were passed into a deep learning model which had an embedding layer followed by an lstm layer which also gave us a fixed length vector now this the fixed length vector output by inception v3 and this deep learning model were then combined uh, or merged into a dense layer which uh, gave us the final prediction using this model we were able to predict uh, text description for the new <clears> set of <throat> images as we added them to the data set. And we iterated on it, uh, revised it multiple times uh, till uh, the description matched uh, what was actually happening in the image. Yeah. Our motivation was that it's very hard to find data sets that are well labeled um, with just the furniture piece in it and not random cats, dogs, people on it. So we wanted to build out a good data set uh, moving forward. And Shrikan will explain the overall roadmap of our demo day today. Yeah, hi. So uh, after we created our training data, we uh, built a custom clip model, uh, which used uh, ResNet to extract uh, uh, video embeddings or like the image embeddings and uh, distal bird to uh, understand the text query that was sent. And the reason why we requested users to input even keywords is <clears throat> it makes it easier for us to go search on a specific uh, data sets versus searching on the entire data set, data set and presenting it to our uh, clip model. In the future, we'd like to extract these entities from the text using NER or other techniques and then uh, not have the user input them. But for now, the user inputs a, a, keyword, a couple of keywords and a, a query string that would be passed on to the clip model, which will then uh, behind the scenes will call our um, Google uh, Cloud Storage um, and it will retrieve images. Uh, the, once the images are retrieved based on the keywords, Clip model will then rank these uh, based on the similarity to the uh, to the search phrase that was entered. Um, if we find that the search phrase is not the the uh, score for the search phrase and the images is less than sixty percent, then we are invoking a blending GAN model, which will take these two different <clears throat> um, uh, take images from these two different data sets, and it will. Uh, blend them into a existing um, uh, living room or um, say bedroom or whichever is the um, layout. And then it blends these images on top of those images and then it returns back to the user. Uh, that's the overall flow of the, uh, flow of the uh, uh, project. Uh, probably um, you can go on explain. Yeah, and on the bottom right, you'll see this map to show you like where we are in the process, just to describe each element. Yes, yeah, so the uh, custom clip model, um, uh, we uh, built our own model. Um, we used the um, out of the out of the box model from uh, Hugging Face. The reason being, uh, when we used our own uh, clip model, we found that it was able to better match if there are multiple objects in the same image. Um, so we used that, and then we also did some custom em um, embedding projection, and then passed on to the clip model. Um, this this slide explains that. And then our tech stack is Streamlit. Uh, most of our code is deployed on Google. Google um, uh, sorry, uh, most of our uh, uh, services are deployed on um, GCP, and then one of it is uh, one of the components is specifically deployed on Vertex AI. Um, that's for uh, the limitation around <coughs> uh, limitation around having to use uh, a GPU, and this is the part where. We take the uh, we take the images from the queries uh, from the returned uh, keywords and we blend them onto an existing uh, data set. Yeah, and this is the original paper that we were referencing, and then we built upon the uh, pre-trained model. In fact, we were able to contact the authors of this paper and just speak with them about how exactly they built the training pipeline. Um, and then you can see we like had to perform segmentation to an extent masking it, and then compositing the two just simple copy paste, but then blending uh, properly. So they used more natural images, nothing to do with furniture. So a lot of our work was adapting it to a furniture versus room data set. Um, and this is just a reference for like the type of software available. And this is the segmentation uh, that we performed. And real- over seven minutes, so please wrap oh, yeah, up if sure. you can. 
Thank you. Uh, so really quickly running through the tools, we have the storage, deployment, and we would like to demo. So if we have, for instance, black bean bags and yellow bean bags, and then we try to say something like black bean bag next to a white bookshelf. And then we try to perform the search. Okay, so we see that the first couple of images are next to the white bookshelf, and this is still next to a bookshelf with a white siding, mm -hmm. um, but not entirely white. Um, and then we really quickly show the generated image where we merge mm -hmm. two completely different pieces of furniture um, onto the same one. So, nice, nice. and take, mm -hmm. just want to make sure I share, and then we say some really weird thing. 18th century coffee <laughs> table next to a wooden arm chair. And then this we had to cache because the inference takes a long time, mm -hmm. but I'm really more than happy to show the GAN process because we did spend a lot of time developing it. Um, and this is the supervised model. And um, we can see that it merged um, a random like, blue armchair uh, or the best fit for the blue armchair. Um, with an 18th century coffee table, the best fit for whatever of that it could find, onto uh, a background that it thought was fitting. In this case, it's like the slitting room TV room setup. Yeah, happy to take any questions afterwards as well. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, due to time constraint, <laughs> we will not be taking questions. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, and now our third to last group, Camille's group for item Q&A for e-commerce, who is going to be presenting over at Zoom. Awesome. Can you guys hear us? Okay. Mm -hmm. yes. okay. Yeah. So we built a Q&A system for product search, and this sort of came from our inspiration, having worked in retail before. Um, and thinking through some of the challenges that consumers face when looking for products that they want, but not having uh, the right tools or services to, to find that through just the normal search. And so i um, happy to introduce ourselves. Uh, my name is Kamel, I'm MSCS at Stanford, also doing my MBA. Uh, I'll let Adrian, my partner, also introduce himself. Yeah, I'm an SCPD student, uh, kind of uh, part-time taking some courses at Stanford, but I have a background in data science, also an MBA from, from Cornell Tech. So yes, as Camille was saying, uh, we were thinking a lot of like how when we help customers to find the right products when they're purchasing, especially in um, in e-commerce and specifically in retails, right? Um, and thinking a lot of like why can't web search start uh, in, um, including all our contextual data, right? We know that most of the uh, e-commerce side are still um, focusing on the traditional retrieval technologies where you're they're trying to match. Uh, specific tokens to some kind of document catalog and a lot of context is lost, right? So uh, these are like a couple of examples. Uh, this is a specific example for some protein bars, right? Um, we we're trying to find these. They're just trying to, to, to match um, a, a couple of, of tokens, right? But 
you know, the image has a lot of information. Um, we have the nutrition facts and also at the same time, we have some product details uh, that, you know, some customers are, uh, might try to find some answers or try to find some products based on these product details, right? So think about like, why would be the next generation of search, uh, especially with large language model? Why can we uh, add another layer where we can ask specific uh, questions uh, for, for to, to know details about products, right? Um, so we were thinking about like, if we want to ask if it's soy free for, for, for this example, can we get back a response, right? We were thinking that there might be a couple of applications that maybe a chatbot um, just pops out when you select a product when you're doing the search, right? Um, so the solution was to fine tune a Q&A model um, for specific items, descriptions to enable a uh, more seamless experience, shopping experience, right? Um, and I will take, Camille, to take these, these kind of challenges that we were trying to, 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 to focus on. Yeah. So a few things that we thought about, at least immediately, was if we took an out of the box question and answering model, would that be sufficient? And we found that for a lot of different edge cases, it wasn't perfect. I mean, item descriptions are pretty granular. Uh, information is pretty sparse. And sometimes these Q&A models can't really get the right intuitive answer. And so uh, it almost renders the user experience quite uh, useless because you, you'd have to go back and still look at the description to find the information. Um, at times we were also thinking how much data would you need uh, in terms of item product uh, description as well as the questions uh, to be able to fine tune a Q&A model to be specific to this sort of use case and who would label that data set and sort of how would we how would we curate that to, to sort of build this uh, model that was fine tuned specifically for the task at hand. Um, and then some auxiliary questions that we also had was what would the data infrastructure look like for both ingesting that data, um, processing it, making it available for annotation, it, uh, taking that information once it is annotated, uh, processing that for the model to train, and then also making some sort of uh, infrastructure to be able to then uh, service that through an API. And then can this scale to all products? Um, one of the things that we were thinking about is, um, as, as Adrian will mention next, we, we focused in specifically on protein bars, but there are other products that are that exist in the retail space. And can we can we expand the model to both generalize to those domains and still be pretty useful uh, from a search perspective? Exactly. For all these challenges, we thought that we should start small, right, and focus on one type of product. So we chose protein bars because sometimes, you know, people are trying to find very specific details about them. Uh, so we thought it would might be a, a cool um, uh, use case, right? Uh, so here's a little bit of the infrastructure, nothing crazy with Scrap for some products um, on, on walmart.com came out with CSVs, did a little bit of data wrangling. Um, and we put up a Prodigy labeling tool to help us uh, pass the context that we came from the descriptions and, and some of the ingredients. And we train a Q&A model, right? So I think that Camille is ready to, to do the demo of some of this, these results, right? Perfect, okay, awesome. Uh, let me know if you can see my screen. Um, Cool. Okay. So on the left is sort of our model. Uh, we built an API solution where you could take context that is the protein data description um, and then ask it any question and it would give you answers. And so I've sort of, for the sake of demo and time, sort of done this beforehand, but you can hit compute and you'll see that our model predicted that the flavor of this was peanut butter chocolate chip. But when you ask uh, the model that is uh, just the baseline model that we trained on, which was uh, without being fine tuned, it doesn't really get the answer. It just says delicious. Um, and there's a few other edge cases like this. So like you can ask it, is it vegan? And our model will predict vegan dairy free. Um, if you ask, for example, the baseline model, sometimes it doesn't actually get the full context. It says dairy free, but that's not really the answer you were looking for. Um, and then there's uh, specific things about brands. And this is where we saw a lot of challenges for, for the model uh, that wasn't fine-tuned on, on the data set that we had. Um, it, it really struggles to identify brand information. And so you could, uh, you could be looking at different products and want to find out like what brand uh, the protein bar is, uh, but you wouldn't be able to get that information uh, directly through some of the default models that we'd, we'd seen. Um, and then there's also some philosophical questions that we ran into, um, specifically like around when you ask something regarding whether it's non-GMO, you get the right answer, but it has extra context. And it, it, there, were, there were other examples also where, for example, you might ask it, 
um, like how many grams of protein there is. And it would tell you uh, that it, it had 20 grams of vegan protein versus just, just the number 20. And the question was, which one is more useful from a user experience, especially when someone is trying to get more information about a product. Um, and so we, we thought it was useful to think a little bit about um, what it takes to define what, what, whether or not an answer from our system is correct or not, and what type of system would be required to do some sort of online learning and, and help refine the system over time. So yeah, a lot of learnings. Um, and I think this is gonna be the, uh, uh, the final slide. Uh, but yeah, uh, we really understood that the, 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 the most complex part of this, of this problem was data, right? Um, and like doing the feature engineering, uh, it's, it's quite challenging, right? Um, another thing that we learned and it was a little bit surprising, uh, is like the importance of fine tuning uh, these kind of models. Uh, the out of the out of the box model, like a just trained with squad uh, data, uh, work well at the beginning for the MVPs. But we're just starting to refine to be a little bit more hard on this type of question. Uh, really, you know, uh, start to to lose that battle. So fine tuning is extremely important for for all these cases, right? Um, as Camille was saying, it was very hard to quantify what it was. What is a good answer and what it's not, and uh, 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 what is good and what is a bad answer, right? Uh, I think there's a lot of nuances, and obviously that affects you how you can, how you uh, measure accuracy of this model, right? And we just like realize that transformers are are great, and I think they're going to take a lot of uh, the problems that we see day to day to to the next level. Um, and I think we're going to finish the presentation here um, and open to questions. So if you can go back to the slide where they have the system design and uh, architecture, how are you using yeah. like Vertex and other stuff uh, with Hugging Face? I'm a bit confused because I think that's the interface for fine-tuned models. Uh, so is yes. this, okay. So yeah, pretty much most of the infrastructure we're running on, on as, as you can see, like in, Google, in our Google Cloud project, but yeah, which is like a typical notebook on, in one of the user managed notebooks on, on Hugging Face, but then you can push that model into your project. But Camille uh, can add a little bit of more, more details how, how we do that. Yeah, so I think I think a lot of uh, you see at the bottom, those were nice to have. So I think one of the things that we wanted to experiment with was eventually, obviously, we want to be able to dedicate this as an API service and benefit from sort of the shared experience that a lot of retail stores have, um, sort of share the knowledge that users are using. As you as you would get like user input, you'd be able to find the whole service as, as a whole for, for, for multiple different uh, users of that API. So that's where we sort, sort of saw the extension of that kicking in and not just being the standalone system. Okay, I know it's been a really long day. Thank you all for bearing with us, whether you're here in person or watching over at Zoom. Now, this is our second to last group who will be presenting a very exciting project on automatic American Sign Language transcription. For our demo later. For our demo later, please join the Zoom call um, using this QR code while we present. Good evening, everyone. I'm Sasank. I'm Raymond. And I'm Pranav. We present Signidio, a video conferencing tool to automatically annotate American Sign Language, ASL, alphabet. We've all been involved with CSP Social Good and are deeply passionate about the intersection of tech and social impact, especially accessibility. One in every eight people has some form of hearing loss in the US and five, up to 500,000 people use ASL as their first language. ASL is also used in other parts of the world like Canada and Southeast Asia and by people without disabilities to communicate. To frame the problem more concretely, there's an increasing trend of virtual meetings. However, many sign language speakers are unable to fully naturally participate. An ASL interpreter is often needed which who are short in supply and can be very costly. This limits ASL speakers to the chat, which is often overlooked in a Zoom context. We aim to resolve these pain points to help both ASL speakers and non-speakers easily communicate with each other. 
There is no existing solution like this. Initially, we had three criteria for success, and here's how our system uh, addresses those goals. As a high-level overview, uh, there are three primary components to our system. One, the physical component, which is the virtual camera and the virtual microphone. This corresponds to our goal of an easily parsable UI, where we decided to include the transcripted text at the bottom of the screen, in addition to audio output with text-to-speech to, uh, to help visually impaired uh, individuals. Second, the feature extractor, which extracts individual hands uh, from the frame using Google's media pipe, a hand tracking uh, CV system that maps joints in the human hand to coordinates, such as a middle fingertip. With our first goal of robustness and uh, accuracy, uh, media pipe affords robustness to different types of hands due to invariance in skin color, lighting, and so forth. Third, we run the features through a deep learning model, which then outputs a prediction, and we display the prediction on the screen. Media pipe and the features uh, integrate well to align with the low latency goal, which is crucial for video streaming technologies. Uh, our model development process uh, took into account running a model on edge to minimize latency, so we decided to uh, use a relatively lightweight model. In terms of our ML philosophy, we utilized a data-driven approach. We found that even state-of-the-art fingerspelling data sets utilized in research papers uh, consisted of poor quality images that don't match real-world video conferencing conditions. In general, the images typically only consisted of a hand in the frame. They came from a single person. They were usually just from the left hand. Uh, they weren't taken with a webcam and just in general lacked generalizability. We recruited fluent speakers of ASL from our uh, communities to sign letters of the alphabet with both their left and their right hands. As a result, we came out with a robust trained data set that addressed these challenges. All right, on the inference side, we also used a similar procedure. Uh, our inference, current inference data set did not accurately represent video calling conditions. As a result, we created a unique inference set uh, using uh, images from uh, Zoom webcam to stress test our model. So here are our model performances. Um, there's kind of two major important callouts. First, existing CNN models such as ResNet have incredibly poor performance generalizing to real world finger spelling inference data. In contrast, our handcrafted features perform much better. Second, training on our custom data set uh, that we created greatly improves performance. As you can see, um, it more than doubled our accuracy. Uh, and this really proves the value of our data set development. Now for the live demo of Sinidio in action. We will use a live Zoom call to show the power of Sinidio. Feel free again to use the QR code to join the call. For this video, Raymond will be using sign language to communicate with Pranav, who will be joining the Zoom call whose screen you see projected. I've entered the Zoom call, activated Sinidio, and will now sign to communicate. I'll start by first getting something off my chest about the instructor. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Notice Sinedio works for both Raymond's left and right hand, unlike any existing solutions. Signing can be tough. Notice how Raymond can quickly correct his mistakes using delete. On my end, I see the live captioning with minimal latency and get the audio corresponding to this annotation. We experimented a lot with different display speeds and allow the user to customize this for their individual preferences and comfort levels. This makes uh, Raymond feel more like a part of the call and allows us to share a more intimate connection. Anyways, Raymond, what's your favorite food? Funny, I figured you were more of a potato chip kind of guy. Um, can I get a suggestion for someone's favorite uh, animal in the chat? Thank you.
We believe it is a human right to be heard and understood. This is the power of Sinedia. We bring ML-based ASL alphabet transcription to video conferencing tools, starting with Zoom. Thank you very much. Project. Uh, and now we're going to compile the judges' scores. And in terms of student choice awards, we ended up making a change. So we will actually be announcing that over at instead. So we will be publishing a Google form, some ad, and then we will be compiling the scores for students choice awards over ad. Um, and now we're going to announce or we're going to compile the scores first. So give us uh, a few minutes. So yeah, we will let the judges <laughs> give us a few words. <laughs> yes. So if the judges have anything you want to say, oh wait, hold on. Can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you. Can yes. See you. yes. Ciao guys, so I, I just wanted to, to say a few words. Um, so first of all, I'm really impressed. So congratulations, you know, to all of you. And I guess, you know, to Chip, Chloe and everybody involved in this course is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the results are amazing. I was really, really impressed. Um, and uh, it, it was great to see a couple of things that I wanted to call out. So one, a lot of this project is actually real applicability. Uh, some of them are very close to my, I wouldn't say to my heart, but at least, <laughs> at least to my, to my wallet, as in it, really close to something that I do for a living, which is e-commerce tech. So a lot of you have actually pretty interesting ideas in recommendation, uh, in e-commerce and, and so on and so forth. Information retrieval, I saw some things doing clip, which is things we are exploring at my lab very recently. So congratulations guys, like they're very, very relevant. The other thing that I want to call out, which is very, very unusual for people your age, is the maturity of the presentation and the ability to always put a context in what you're doing. Like, I really love that everybody has a demo. Some of the demo, by the way, are really, really, really incredible. Um, and, and the fact that you always start to motivate why you're doing you know, this effort in the first place. Um, storytelling is a super important part of the job. I know that people don't like to say this out loud or, you know, it's kind of like, you know, not maybe what you sign up for when you do, you know, computer science at Stanford. But at the end of the day, a significant part of your, of your success is going to basically be, be determined not by your tech stack, but by the story you tell. Um, and you guys have all made an impressive effort, an impressive result on that. So don't lose this component. I'm sure Chip was a really good teacher on that. Uh, this is a super important part of, of, your, of your life. So congratulations to everybody. I, I was really impressed. Um, if you want or you think you need my feedback, I'm happy to give private, like say 30 minutes, you know, rerun if somebody wants to have me actually interrupt every two slides and, and, and give pointers and so on. So if you want or you think it can be helpful given my skill set and my experience, reach out to me. I'm super easy to find. Okay. Congratulations again. Yeah, I think uh, we're actually almost done. Uh, so, Goku, do you want to say something? Oh, sure. Uh, echoing <laughs> a lot of, of what Jacopo said already. Um, but oh, four hours, it was, it was awesome. I think a lot of interesting projects. I'll maybe talk about some of the things that haven't been covered. I, I think I really loved the amount of detail you guys put in, like into creating the data set. Some of you just tossed out pre-trained models, said we don't need this, and kind of started from scratch because it just made sense. Uh, I think some of you even did user studies, which is which is amazing. Um, so I, I love I love just to focus around all of that, and I, I would love to see everyone, but definitely a, a handful of projects go on to the next stage. Uh, Bruno and I, Bruno and I were talking during break. I think a lot of these can definitely be standalone companies that, if you guys are really passionate about what you've built, could could definitely be amazing products. So um, yeah, I hope a few teams do keep going. But yeah, great job overall. Just very impressed. We'll wrapped around um yeah you know not not that much to add but i was really impressed honestly at how everyone gave a live demo 
I've been to a lot of demo days where there's a lot of pre-recorded demos. And I think that, you know, you, it was really impressive that you had working models, working servers, and, you know, most of you, all of you felt confident enough really showing it off in real time. I, I think that really elevates it to the next level and shows that you really were very thorough in what you built, how you built it, and very confident in what you shipped. Um, like Goku was saying, I think the breadth of applications over the last four hours is really fascinating. I think there wasn't a lot of duplicate projects. You know, there weren't a lot of things that honestly were kind of, you know, overdone. I think there's a lot of really original ideas, really original execution, and also very thoughtful uh, workflows that were very, you know, actual like user flows. You could see people using this. You know, I speak as a VC and investor. I think a lot of these could be standalone companies. You could probably go out and this could have been the pitch you used to raise your pre-seed round. So <laughs> so if you want to go start a company, Goku and I are happy to help. <laughs> um, but honestly, you know, great work, guys, and, you know, really amazing job in the projects and in the pitches. I think I'm almost done compiling, but, like, I think there's some students in to the end. Uh, does anyone want to say anything? Thanks for saying something. <laughs> we have two more judges. <laughs> uh, do the judges over Zoom want to say something? So, Dieter, go ahead. I want to echo what everyone said uh, so far. And then from a Google standpoint, um, personally, as so I've been doing AI in Google for over four years, and I could uh, I could see some of the work here easily translate into what we have been trying to do at, at Google. Some of these models that, um, are, are work that we're actually doing. I have teams deployed building some of these models um, and, and, and I would highly encourage the uh, teams to build on this. And um, as, as I said, this could be companies um, in itself. Each each of these demos were so powerful like, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm amazed that you've been able to come up with such polished demos in such a short time frame. And uh, there are real business cases um, in, in terms of multiple industries, healthcare, financial services, contracts, um, music, entertainment, media. Um, so I, I'm, I'm blown away and I'm really excited. The four hours passed away very quickly. And uh, I'm, I just want to say kudos and congrats to the class. Uh, same here. We got really great energy and a lot of talent in that room. And uh, to add more to this, like a lot of folks, uh, you know, have had only a, you know, quarter to do this. Actually, it's very hard to do this in uh, a, an entire like you know year. I would say and polish everything and get the um, details. The level of attention to details is very impressive. So uh, 360, right? Like this is what's missing. Actually, if you think about it, if you go to the industry. The first thing you would see is like there's always this like uh, chasm or gap between science and engineering and the applied science, like trying to marry this with ML ops or uh, uh, getting that portfolio of skills under your belt is extremely important. And I'm just extremely impressed today, like how uh, the well roundedness of everything that's been presented. So thank you so much for, you know, uh, making us part of this. Yeah, I just want to thank uh, all the students for like really hard working this entire quarter. And I want to thank the judge for staying with us until the end. And I know it's like, I know it's really awesome demos, but I know that I pay attention nonstop for four hours. It's not easy. Um, so actually, I think I'm done compiling. And should I could you just announce it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Wrong that's it. <laughs> I wonder if people have any guests on like, which project are one? Does anyone want to get this? <laughs> <laughs> it's still like shooting us down the food. Yes. Okay, I think it's like very bad. Um, let me just, uh, I'm going to show on now. Try now. Okay, um, I guess we don't need this screen, uh, but I'm just going to show it here in case people want to watch it later. Um, so, our 
Judges Choice Awards. What? You want to go from the Oh. <laughs> oh, we're sharing the screen. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess there is no mystery. So number three is going to be automated annotation of legal contracts. Congratulations. Number two is going to sign Nidio automatic ASL uh, transcription. Congratulations. And number one is going to be Vox Dogs, who had a really, really cool demo. Congratulations. Thank you guys all so much for bearing with us for the past four hours. And we are really impressed with all the demos that we have seen today. So yeah, thank you so much. If you want to say any last few words. <laughs> uh, thank you. I think we just want to hang out a little bit outside. If you want to join us? Um, yeah, but that's it. I know it's dinner time, so I hope you're not too hungry. Thank you all for a great quarter. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.